Good evening, everyone. I declare the meeting open. I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional lands of the Kabi Kabi people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I note that everyone is in attendance. Do I have a mover for the confirmation of the minutes of the ordinary meeting held on the 20th of May? Thank you, Councillor Finzel. Second, thank you, Councillor Wilkie. All in favour? Thank you. Can I have a mover for the confirmation of the minutes of the special meeting held on the 28th of May 2020? Thank you, Councillor no, Stockwell. Move. Thank you, Councillor Lawrenceton. All in favour? Thank you. There are no mayoral minutes. Does anyone have any petitions? No. There are no notified motions, no presentations, and no deputations. That brings us to item eight on page four of the agenda, which is the consideration of the committee reports. Firstly, the Planning and Environment Committee recommendations. Item one was referred to general committee. Item two was referred to general committee. Item three, MCU 20 slash 0037, Planning and Environment Court Appeal number BD 1074 of 2021. Refusal of an application for multiple housing type two duplex at 11 Margaret Crescent, Sunrise Beach. Items four to eight were also referred to the general committee. Item nine, planning applications decided by delegated authority, April 2021. I have a conflict in this matter, so I'll hand over to Councillor Wilkie to assume the chair to consider the conflict of interest declarations. Thank you, Councillor Wilkie. Thank you. I, Councillor Stewart, inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter in relation to the application by Ultram Properties Number 9, PTY LTD, which is Item 12 in this report. I have a friendship with Lee and Rob McCready, who are associated with this applicant. With, as a result of my conflict of interest, I will now leave the meeting room while this matter is considered and voted on. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I've got one to say Councillor Finzel. Yes. I inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter in relation to the application by Alton Properties, number 9 PTY LTD, which is item 12 in this report. I have a relationship with Lee McCready, who is associated with the applicant as Ms McCready was involved with my 2020 election campaign. As a result of my conflict of interest, I will now leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and voted on. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor. <clears throat> I wish to inform the meeting that I also have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter in relation to the application by Alton Properties No. 9, Proprietary Limited, which is item 12 in this report. On 24th of February in 2020, I sought a review of the Independent Council Election Observer as to the public claims of the Future News team, of which Lee McCready was publicly identified as a campaign manager. Lee McCready is associated with the applicant. Although I have a declarable conflict of interest, I do not believe a reasonable person could have a perception of bias because Council's consideration of this application is not to approve or reject it. It is only for noting of a decision that has already been made by staff. Therefore, I will choose to remain in the meeting room. However, I respect the decision of the meeting on whether I can remain and participate in the decision. Would someone care to move the motion whether Councillor Stockwell remains in the room or not? Councillor Lawrenson, seconded by Councillor Wegner. Councillor Lawrenson, uh, what's, what's your um, call on this? It's in the public interest that Council Stockwell participates and votes on this matter because Council believes that as Council's consideration of this application is not to approve or reject it, only to note a decision that has already been made by staff, a reasonable person would trust that the final decision is made in the public interest. Thank you, Councillor Lawrenson. Any other councillors wish to speak to this motion? We've, um, we've, uh, we've debated this, um, this conflict of interest several times and uh, we've gone over it thoroughly, and uh, we've kicked, repeat, council has found repeatedly that um, Stockwell may stay in the room. Thank you. Any other councillors wish to speak? Wish to close, Councillor Lawrenson. Put the motion those in favour. It's carried unanimously. Now we have um, a motion regarding the um, applications decided by delegated authority. I'll, I'll move that. Uh, we have a seconder, please. Councillor Jurisovic. Uh, Anyone wish to speak? Uh, we'll put it to the vote. All in favour? It's carried unanimously. May we have the Mayor and Councillor Finzel back, please.
My pleasure. And then we're up to the uh, top of page six on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, page, top of page six. Oh, so this, okay. So, can I have a mover and a seconder for the adoption of the Planning and Environment Committee recommendations, except we're dealt with by separate resolution? So moved. Thank you, Councillor Stockwell. Oh, will second. Thank you, Madam Mayor. All in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, Kylie. Next up is the Services and Organisation Committee recommendations. These are on page seven of the agenda. Item one, Regional Arts Development Fund, RADF, grant recommendations 2020-21. Item two was referred to the General Committee. Item three, application of national competition policy reform for the 2021-22 budget. Item four, 2021-22 fees and charges. Item five, Go Noosa 2020-21, peak period traffic management evaluation. Can I have a move and a second? Thank, thank you, Councillor Jurisovic. Thank you, Councillor Gazelle. All in favour? Yeah. Can I thank say you. something about the RADF now? No, no, no. 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 Oh. Now we go to the General Committee recommendations on page nine of the agenda. Item one, application for material change of use for short-term accommodation at 75 Williams Road, Kinkin, Councillor Lawrenston. Um, I'd like to move a motion, please. And it reads, if I could have that scrolled down. Thank you. Um, D. So I want course 21 to be deleted and including... 23. 23. 23. Yep, that should be deleted. And, and an inclusion of clause D, include the following advisory note on the decision notice. One, the site contains the headwaters of the King King Creek located on steep slopes, which ultimately drains through Noosa River into Laguna Bay. Loss of vegetation on steep slopes accelerates erosion processes and leads to the degradation of water quality downstream, as well as the loss of soil from the land. It is recommended the ongoing management of weeds and replanting of native species is implemented on the land, particularly around gullies and streams. For information, please see um, the project Keeping It in Kinky. And just for, um, I might read out what is being actually, what you've asked to be deleted. Councillor Lawrence. Um, I'm requesting we delete clause number 23, environmental weeds in the biodiversity overlay area and within 10 metres either side of the mapped secondary waterway must be controlled by an active management program to the reasonable satisfaction of council. A weed control management plan must be lodged with council for review. I'll second it. Um, okay, I'm going to retry this um, today um, because I don't believe that the conditions that were placed, condition 23, are at Monday's general meeting um, were relevant and reasonable. So I'm going to start with that that conditions must be, uh, they're required to be relevant and reasonable. Um, I argue that what I've put before everyone um, is relevant and reasonable. It relates to the application, which is a, an application for a development application for an ST, STA. Um, and the conditions also a reasonable response to the changes that the development will cause. Um, I'm going to start by saying that I approve and support the removal of weed species in an ecologically important area. However, I do not believe that this should be conditioned um, in, an, in, a, in a material change of use application for um, short-term accommodation. Instead, what I'm proposing is that it should be added by way of an advisory note. Um, since Monday's meeting, I've received advice from our planning officers in regards to the cost of Section 23. So I needed to sort of understand is this onerous and is it a reasonable condition? The response I receive from our planning officers is that the area um, that's to be treated is 3,310 square metres. Um, I'll, I'll quote, it's hard to determine a cost without knowing the weeds present and the treatment required. A range of $2 to $10 per square metre could be anticipated depending on slope, access or weed form. This does not account for replanting. So on my calculations, um, the, 
cost can be anywhere between nearly 7,000 to 33,000. And again, that does not include the cost of replanting. Um, further, I asked another question, um, whether the condition imposed in section 23 actually achieved the best environmental um, outcome. The response I received, and again, I quote from planning officers, um, I am concerned without any native replanting to seal the area, the process could lead to accelerated erosion due to lack of vegetation cover and proximity to a watercourse. This in turn will provide optimal, optimal habitat for weed re-establishment, perhaps at greater densities than the original equilibrium. So my opinion that um, that what was proposed is not reasonable, not relevant, and does not achieve um, the best environmental income. It's my opinion that the that by imposing um, this weed management and rehabilitation is again my opinion an excessive use of power. And to use the terms um, quoted by the planning staff on Monday is possibly an overreach. Um, further, I believe it opens us to legal challenge. And for the record, um, we we aren't having many home runs. So in front of us, the condition that I've just imposed um, is relevant and reasonable. Um, and the advisory note which just recommends that the applicant engage in ongoing management on weeds and replanting with native species is, is reasonable um, and does not open us to legal challenge. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak to this? I might ask a question to start, if I may, Mr Chair. Sure. Um, as a, an advisory note on the um, decision notice, is there any obligation on the applicant to undertake any work whatsoever? No, the advisory note is just that. It's an advisory note and suggests what would be good practice for the site. Um, so it encourages them, but it does not enforce anything. It can't be enforced. Um, yeah, so if, um, if the advisory note was turned into a, um, was hardened up into a condition, um, uh, that would represent a better, perhaps um, get a better outcome than what was proposed under 23 because 23 doesn't involve replanting. Is that the, the, the advice from the staff? Yeah, so since um, Monday's General Committee, um, uh, Councillors Ecologists has reviewed um, the proposed condition by Councillors, number 23, and recommended that he has some concerns about it. He said if we're just removing the weeds, it'll mm. result in erosion processes. Mm. And we really should, if we want that to occur, we'd have to ask for some replanting. Otherwise, yep. the site will end up in a worse state than it starts with. So we'd look to... Um, he has put together some amended wording for Condition 23, if Council wishes to add in a requirement to, for rehab. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Are, are we able to have a look at that alternative wording, please? Uh, Yes, I haven't provided it to um, Kylie, but we can oh, do I so have. now. I've given it to Kylie. Oh, you yeah? have? Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Thanks, Kylie. So I might read that out. Is that yeah. Um, 23, it would be alternate wording from scum. Yes. yes. Uh, the riparian buffer area and within 10 metres either side of the mapped waterway must be rehabilitated by controlling environmental weeds and re-establishing native plant species local to the area by an active management program to the reasonable satisfaction of council. A rehabilitation management plan must be endorsed by council through an operational works application. B and C part of that as well? No, yeah, sorry, that was... That's that's okay. So, Terry, I've got a question. What would... Do you have a ballpark figure, and I know it's hard, of what that would cost? So. Yeah, so the estimate of costing that's been provided to uh, Councillor Amelia was really about weed removal, not including rehab. Mm -hmm. So he's given an estimate of um, between 2 and 10 um, square... So. Yeah, basically square metres. 
I'd expect that there'll be some cost above that again to us for some rehabilitation. Um, Kerry, in your experienced opinion, um, do you believe that this is um, fair and reasonable mm. and relevant condition? Yep. Yeah, so um, council in imposing conditions on a development approval is required by the planning legislation to ensure conditions are reasonable and relevant. Um, so in weighing up this matter, we considered whether um, what's occurring on the site through this material change of use and the applicant is proposing to use an existing house for short-term accommodation. So there's no works occurring on the site to accommodate that short-term accommodation uh, in, the, in the existing house. There's no additional works for car parking areas or driveways or the like. Um, so it will have no impact um, or no greater impact on the environmental values of the site and the use of that site for a permanent residence. So for that reason, officers do not consider um, the condition to be reasonable and relevant to this application. Thank you. Uh, my understanding of an operational works application as well is that it would have to, all the work within that operational works application would have to be undertaken before the proposed use of short stay would uh, be able to be undertaken, is that correct? That's correct. Um, all conditions here have to be met prior to commencement of the use, including the requirement to re um, remove the weeds and undertake rehabilitation. It's likely though with a rehabilitation that that would be sort of a three year plan, so we just need to undertake the works of weed removal um, and replanting, but then there'd be some ongoing monitoring for the next two years, so they could commence the use just after that weed removal and rehab. Uh, yeah, Connie, kind of, can you go back to the original 23? Um, so yeah, further to the original condition 23, a weed control management plan in my uh, um, uh, estimation of what it would involve would have included some sort of a, a replanting and, and a rehabilitation uh, originally because um, the point of weed control and management is the fact that yes once you remove weeds you need to rehabilitate that land otherwise you do have degradation so would uh, could a weed management control plan a weed control management plan as uh, previously suggested not include uh, revegetation <laughs> I think it would be better if council wants weed control and rehabilitation that the condition is amended so it's clear to the applicant. Mm. Otherwise, no, I think there could be some confusion around the condition and what's required. Councillors, I'm just aware that we uh, the, the motion we have before us actually has um, number 23 struck out. So mm. that's the motion we're dealing with, just mm. so with yeah. Amelia's... So, which is the addition of the of D, the yeah. advisory note, and then the... Uh, removal of mm -hmm. 23. Yeah. So would anyone like to speak to this motion? Question. Um, how many people live in the property at the moment and how many are likely to be accommodated by its its um, change of use to a, a, a multi-bedroom um, short-term accommodation property? Um, so I don't uh, know the exact number of people who live in the house. That's not something that I'm aware of, but I can see from the plans on page 10 of the Planning and Environment Committee agenda, that it is uh, a four bedroom house. Um, actually, it's got one, two, three, yeah, a four bedroom house. Um, so um, you would, yeah, you would expect, um, yeah, I'm not sure of the combination that exists now. Uh, in short term, um, you may get two people per room, you may get one person in some room, I'm not sure. So, okay, um, is, it, is it likely then that there's a potential fourfold increase in human impact on that site due to the, the change of use? Um, it is possible that the short term accommodation may look to accommodate more people, but for the parts of the year that I expect if it's used short term it would remain vacant, um, so it could balance out. I'd also expect when people are on holidays um, for a weekend um, that they're not doing any mowing, um, removal of veg on the site. Um, they've, I think they'd simply not be interested mm. in that part. And if the, um, the applicant is unhappy with a condition that mandates weed removal and rehabilitation of the riparian area, um, that doesn't need to go to court, does it? 
how they can make rep what's the process for them to make representation? Um, <clears throat> Uh, they have a couple of options. They have the option to appeal immediately once the decision notice is issued, um, but a, a better path would be for them to make representations to council and come back and explain why they consider it to be unreasonable or, or whatever their opinion is and ask the council to remove it or amend it in some way. Would that then come back before the council for a, dis a decision or would, would staff uh, uh, remove that condition <coughs> or otherwise? <laughs> Given the discussion on this matter, I'd be bringing it back to council. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So, just to clarify uh, a point of question that, that uh, Council Boogie raised there in uh, the number of uh, guests that uh, may occupy the premises one uh, one time. My understanding is condition six uh, limits that to eight guests at uh, any one time. Is that is that not correct? Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Joe. You're right. That the short term is limited to eight, eight guests. Thank you. Mm. I'll speak to them. Thank motion. I thank um, I thank Councillor Lawrence for the research she's done on this. It's it's excellent, and it's helped inform the debate. the the um, The motion that the change motion that she's brought before us actually articulates why it's so important that the environmental values on this site are looked after, and we have an opportunity before us now to ensure that the environmental values are looked after. Everything within our power. It may. Uh, I take the, count, the staff's advice, it may be an overreach, but it's an opportunity which I personally feel we need to um, exercise. It will not, it, it, the, the applicants perfect, if, if they're of a mind that it is an overreach, they're perfectly within their right to make representation back to the staff without needing to go through an expensive court process, even though we do have an excellent record in court. It, we hope it will never go to that. Uh, we've had two wins today, I understand. Um, one of them is four cases wrapped up in one, if I'm in informed correctly. So we do have an excellent record in that regard. We don't ever want to test it in, this, in relation to this. But um, I feel that um, I will be support... Um, Councillor Lawrence has very well articulated why it's important to protect the environmental values on the site. But I like the advice from the staff in the um, proposed motion that's maybe tested later or not. Um, that will ensure that we exercise our opportunity, take this opportunity to do everything within our power to ensure that. I think we owe that to um, to um, the community to do that. And if, as mentioned on Monday, the the applicants, we're assuming that, in, in believing it's an overreach, we're assuming that the applicants see that as an impost, an unreasonable impost. But they may very well, may be very well be aligned with their values. They may very well be wanting to do that anyway. Um, so it's a way of putting that to them and they can always make representation back. Thanks, Councillor. Thank you. I'm going to move an amendment and that's to add condition 23. As staff have, have provided, it's not their suggestion, but removing the words, the riparian but... Uh, the riparian buffer area within 10 metres either side of the map waterway. Okay, so you haven't included the, the stuff down the back in that recommendation? Uh, yeah, that's just the riparian buffer area. Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah. So take out the riparian buffer area that within 10 metres either side of the mapped waterway must be that, uh, yeah, take out within, that 10 metres either side of the mapped waterway must be rehabilitated by controlling environmental weeds and establishing native plant species local to the area by an active management program to the reasonable satisfaction of council. A rehabilitation management plan must be endorsed by council through an operation works application. Could I suggest that an area 10 metres on the side might be better way? I'm happy for you to, to suggest that improvement. Would anyone like to second this? I'll, I'll second it for the purpose of debate. So the substantive motion has brought up, as Councillor Wilkie, the, the reasons why you might do it. Uh, Councillor Lawrence has, has said it's about the cost compared to the nature of the application. I'm going to argue from a completely different angle. This is about whether to approve the development or not. This is about whether material change of use meets the strategic outcomes of our planning scheme. And without rehabilitation and without improving the natural environment, I don't think it does. Because it's a material change of use, so you have to look at it from the whole planning scheme perspective. 
Now, I personally believe that every time there's a mature change of use and there's a planning gain, that there has to be a requirement to contribute to the community. In this case, we know there's a water quality issue in the Kinkin catchment. We know it's very steep. What we, the staff have quite correctly pointed out was we don't quite know if there is a significant environmental weed program, but we do know what the strategic outcomes in the planning scheme say. And they say for nature-based recreation, the development shouldn't increase the impact. And it's about achieving, in my opinion, in these areas, the strategic outcomes for biodiversity and environment. And some of those are um, natural waterways and wetlands are maintained in a natural state and with development providing for rehabilitation and enhancement to improve the ecological function and water quality. So clearly the outcome anticipated and desired by the planning scheme is that development applications, I'll say it again, improve enhancement to improve the ecological function of water quality. So that particular stretch of creek that's mapped on the biodiversity overlay is one that on reviewing the overhead and you know, the satellite imagery is one that isn't as good quality as the riparian buffer. The riparian buffer actually looks like it's in good condition and it's quite a good um, ecosystem and it may have environmental weeds but it's they're unlikely to be dominant. So that's why I've taken that reference to that out because I do think that we do have to look at what's the likely cost of doing this and is that an impost? I believe that there can be a rehabilitation that is cheaper than taking it to council to the Planning Environment Court by a long way, that does achieve some of these aims. You know, like another aim in the strategic outcomes, your ecological buffers to wetlands and waterways are provided to protect and improve ecosystem health, water quality and habitat to flora and fauna, um, support fisheries, recreation, tourism. This is a tourism enterprise. And surely in a biosphere, we want all our tourism enterprises to have a plan to make the environment on the site as good as possible. So it really does come back to, is this a suitable application? Is this a suitable use for the site? And can we achieve the overarching aims of the planning scheme? And to me, the, 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 the note is a very good one, because it gives the why. Why should we be looking at this particular waterway? But I do think it is reasonable for Council to say that we want our tourism enterprises to meet and to try and assist achieve the strategic outcomes in the planning scheme. And that's why I've moved the amendment. Can I just uh, clarify the Council's top of amendment? Um, it is simply to add a new condition 23 and not removing that's right. the note. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to make sure we have that correct. Thank you. So, um, Councillor Stockwell is his. Uh, amendment was to include a new uh, condition 23, but to leave the advisory note um, that Councillor Lawrence has put forward as an advisory note, and that stays in there. I'll speak to this. I won't be supporting this amendment. This is not a major tourism operator. This is not Sopitel. This is a family who can have a maximum number of guests at eight people. This is material change of use for short-term accommodation. How we've got to weeds is beyond me. We are, talking, we are talking about conditions, right? These guys have a huge amount of conditions. They've got a contact person. They've got a code of conduct. They've got car parking. They've got waste management. They can only have eight guests. I believe on Monday that now they can only be outside until 9 p.m. There are a number of conditions put across. This is a house. They can have a maximum of eight people at one time. That's a family. That's a husband and wife and six kids or three kids a grandparents and, and, par and parents, or and an aunt. This is not a major tourism provider. These conditions, which are potentially going to cost, which we've heard, between seven and $30,000, are onerous. Even our own planning department said, potentially, this is overreaching, overarching. I think we've gone above and beyond. I think Absolutely, if this was a big operator, a big provider, and there were some really serious, big environmental concerns, then that would be fair and reasonable. But I don't think in this case, when you're talking about a house with a maximum of eight people allowed, with already stringent conditions, that this is fair and reasonable. So I won't be supporting this amendment. Um, 
again, I state I approve and support the removal of weed species. Um, this is an ecologically important area. There's no dispute about that. Councillor Stockwell, you made reference to the cost. Um, I also mentioned whether it was reasonable, whether the response to the changes that the development will cause are reasonable. Changes that a development, which is a change in application for short-term accommodation for maximum of eight people, is imposing a weed management scheme and rehabilitation and replanting, is that a reasonable response to an MCU for STA? Um, I'm challenged on this one. I would love to agree to the condition and, and test it, as Council Wilkie said, but I'm concerned that testing it is going to delay this application even further. I think uh, inconvenience is not a reason for not pushing something that is important to me um, in best <coughs> environmental outcomes. But I just think, again, we may be just pushing it a little bit. Um, I use the word excessive use of power. Um, in my opinion, I think that this cause is um, a little bit far, far reached and, and an abuse of power, in my opinion. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Um, Councillor Lawrence and Rayson, a very good question there is, if this motion as it is read there is, is passed tonight, will it stop the, the business from operating as short-term accommodation? Um, so before they can commence using it for short-term accommodation, they must meet all the conditions of approval. Mm. Um, so there is some work for the applicant to do because um, there's some structures on the site that are not approved, so they need to um, address that before they can commence. So there are a few things that they need to do before they can commence. So I don't think it's necessarily stopping them. Yeah, but if it's not, they wouldn't be required to do all this work on the, on the riparian buffer before they can operate as a short-term accommodation. Yes. yes, they are They are required to. So the conditions... Well, they do. They are required to do the rehabilitation and the weed removal before they commence short term. That's Such how all conditions of a material change of use work, yes. So, so, so on that, following on from that, Kerry, that would mean that this, this family or this, these people would have to outlay potentially between seven and $30,000 based on, you know, sort of let's look at, you know, they're not set in stone figures, but they're, they're reasonable, a reasonable guesstimate they'd have to outlay between seven and $30,000 before they received one bit of income from short-term accommodation. Um, yes, that's right. They would have to meet this condition before they start. Um, Councillor um, Brian's amendment where he's removed the riparian buffer and changed the wording has reduced the extent of the area that's now required uh, for the works. So instead of the, you know, the 33 hundred square metres that was talked about, it's probably now around 1,600, so it's probably halved it. Um, is there a cost for an operational works application, Kerry? Uh, yes, there is. There's an application fee to Council for the operational works, and um, you can ask me what that is. I, <laughs> I think it would be a, our minimum delegated fee, which is around 1,300. And there's also additional costs of replanting. That's not been factored in the numbers that were thrown around today. No, the costs that were provided were based purely on the condition for weed removal as Council put forward at the General. And carry on your figures, it was 1,600, and this is very crude math here without a calculator. Me too. Uh, <laughs> so we're looking at about between 3,200 and 16,000, if it's $20 square metre, or thereabouts. 30, sorry, 30, yeah, about 3,200 to 16,000 potentially, if it was 1,600 square yeah. metres. Yeah. Yes, plus the 1300 that they incur. Yes. Yeah. Plus potentially revegetation. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, um, can I ask a question from Anthony Dow, Economic Development um, Officer, uh, Executive, excuse me? Um, Anthony, is someone setting up a um, short term accommodation provider in the hinterland? And we have identified that there is a need in the hinterland for. Um, housing choices and housing supply, particularly in short-term accommodation. Um, can I ask your opinion on 
whether you think the condition placed no. is risk. No, no I can't. Sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's not a question. Um, it's a technical okay. question in terms of quality of life and approach okay. over the next um, five years. Does council have an obligation under the local economic plan to support um, small businesses? Through you, Chair. Yes, um, thank you. I guess the diversification agenda agenda says that uh, we certainly want to spread the load from the coast to the hinterland, so that would certainly fit that um, a com more accommodation provision in the hinterland um, fits with that strategy. Um, and I think the, the provision of good quality accommodation will support um, New South Trails network, etc. So it certainly is something that we would want to encourage and it would fit fit with that strategy around growth in the hinterland rather than probably the more congested coastal areas in peak time. So just for clarification, there is a need for short-term accommodation in the hinterland. I think I would clarify by this. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the planning team has already determined that. That's why the planning team makes these provisions for that, for that to occur. And that's the policy decision the council made when it established its planning team. Um, Would anyone else like to speak to the Yeah, questions? I just have a question. Oh, um, just a question. When the application came in and you were talking to the applicants, prior to this coming up as a debate, were any of these issues raised around jewelry management and rehabilitation? Uh, no, we didn't have that discussion with the applicant because uh, right from the outset we didn't consider such a condition to be reasonable and relevant. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Are there any other operational works that have to be undertaken? Um, uh, before they, they can start oper uh, operating? Uh, no, there's no other operational works that they're required to do. The only other works that they need to address are the building works that are on site without an approval. So they need to prepare plans and launch building works applications for those works. So they still have a fair bit of planning and, and applications they have to go through before they can operate as a short-term accommodation? That's right. There's a little bit of work to do before they can start, so it won't just be the rehab that's sort of delaying them, if you like. And just to be clear, they need to um, lodge a rehabilitation management plan through an operational works application with the council before they can operate, or do they have to have completed all that rehabilitation and replanting before they can operate? So they have to lodge the application for operational works for the weed removal and rehab, and they would need to complete the works based on the way this condition is worded. Um, council could amend the condition to give them a greater time frame if they wished, so to undertake the works over a period of time, if that was a concern for Council. So that would be, uh, for example, that an area of 10 metres either side of the map waterway must be rehabilitated by controlling environmental weeds and re-establishing native plant species local to that area by an active management program to the reasonable satisfaction of Council over the next five years. Yes. Yeah. Kerry, could it be the case that the applicant doesn't have the money um, for weed re rehabilitation and management, um, and in which case this application might fall through? It's, it's a bit hard um, to ask staff in the financial position. <laughs> that's, not, that's really that's not a matter for the council staff to determine whether they can or can't afford. I accept that. Yeah. I'll speak to the amendment. Thank you. Look, I, I think uh, I agree. If, if all this work has to be done before I can open, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is unreasonable. Mm. If it is, it is work that can be done over the next five to ten years, I think that's more reasonable, given that um, a short-term accommodation business, we heard how uh, all the Airbnbs and stays properties in the hinterland were chockers and full recently. There is clearly a demand for short-term accommodation. There is the potential for them to earn tens of thousands of dollars per year if, if they wished. It is a lovely location. It's likely to be popular. I'm uh, more in favour of, of a, a similar condition that um, has to be abided by over the next five to ten years, which gives them a chance to be up and running as a short-term accommodation business, given that one of the strategic outcomes of the Noosa Planning Scheme is that development applications must improve environmental outcomes, must improve environmental outcomes. It's going from a home to a commercial operation, which is um, essentially the potential of a, a, a hotel in the hinterland. They're very... Um, highly sought after, it's a beautiful location. I, I do agree with the, my fellow councillors that this condition as is currently worded is is unfair, so I, I, I can't support it. I commend Council Stockwell here. I mean, um, I, I know what he was trying to achieve with the original condition 23 and I thought it less onerous than what's here before us now. 
Um, the fact that this is uh, the rehabilitation management plan that needs to be endorsed through, by council through an operational works application, which would mean the, uh, the applicant would need to complete all of those works prior to, uh, to operating as a, a short stay. Um, I do find uh, a, a tad onerous, mm. but on the other hand, I do see Council Stockwell's uh, point. This is a material change of use, and under a material change of use, it does give us an opportunity to turn around and look at the planning scheme as it currently stands and the opportunities there for uh, to, to um, uh, uh, look at the application and uh, see what conditions it does and doesn't meet within the, uh, within the planning scheme and, uh, and look at those opportunities for amendment. However, like Councillor Wilkie, I, 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 again, in the original uh, proposal for uh, um, Condition 23, didn't have a time frame there. It had a weed management plan, which I would have expected to manage weeds, you would also re -bitch. Uh, okay, may, may not have been articulated uh, correct, sufficiently enough, but uh, uh, I would have expected that uh, a, a, a weed management slash rehabilitation plan could be undertaken over a, over a period of operation. This will become potentially a commercial operation, or has the potential to raise uh, revenue and income for the, uh, for the applicant. And as such, some of that could be re returned to, uh, to the property to, uh, to manage uh, better manage the, uh, the weed infestation that is within uh, a riparian buffer and an area that we know has been getting sufficient uh, 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 that has contributed to the uh, silting of the, the river over time and is getting a lot of uh, rehabilitation in other areas and working with uh, landowners in particular for uh, uh, re-establishment of, uh, of uh, degraded land uh, and uh, control of weeds in the area. So I won't be supporting the amendment as it stands but I do appreciate the intent of what Council Stockwell is trying to do. I also understand the, uh, um, what the, the perspective the other council is coming to that it, uh, it may be particularly onerous, and I think the operational works application uh, could be onerous, but I am, uh, I am open to the opportunity, as uh, the original uh, motion had, of some sort of a, uh, a time spent plan for weed management and rehabilitation on the site with the material change of use. Question for um, management planning, if I could. Um, a rehabilitation management plan, can that be endorsed by council by means other than through uh, an operational works application? Well, um, it does take time to review such a plan. So that's why um, the suggestion was for an operational works application. So it, it, it takes time and money for council to review it because. Uh, there's, a, there's a fair bit in it. I think it's re reasonable to charge a fee and you would do so through an operational works plan. Um, is it reasonable to impose a condition that um, asks the applicant to engage or um, enter into an agreement with like Landcare um, to work on weed management. Um, I, I've put it in a form of an advisory note. Is there something, can we get, without putting any onerous um, conditions, um, just an obligation for them to meet with Landcare? I don't believe we could do it as a condition that you require an applicant to deal with a particular organisation. Mm -hmm. um, so having it as a suggested solution in a, in a um, advisory note it's might be best. fine. But requiring a, an applicant to deal with company A or uh, not-for-profit organisation B, um, I don't think it'd be a condition. Um, obligation to meet with planning officers in council to discuss how best um, to put together a, a weed management plan. Is that um, possible? It's a similar thing. Um, you know, someone had to, if, if for argument's sake, this um, amendment became. Um, a condition of the approval uh, or something similar to it, then um, obviously they'll need to comply with it. They're always welcome to come and talk to council staff before um, lodging that. Um, requiring it as a condition, I don't think is going to be Thank you. Councillor, any other questions? Because we Councillor Wakener and Councillor Finzel, <coughs> who are the only two who haven't spoken to this motion, if you'd like to amend it. Okay. Um, in this case, um, we, I think council would love to see in the, in the yeah, community expects to bring this property up to the new standard and you get one bite at the apple when this, when this happens and this is the time of material change of use. 
And so if there's a certain standard that I believe the community expects and uh, this uh, Brian's motion reflects that the standard. Thank you, Councillor Wagner. Councillor Kinsley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, um, a challenging um, situation we find ourselves in with this um, proposed amendment. We take on board the staff recommendation that they feel it was overreaching and was not discussed with the applicant during the process of application. Um, I think Councillor uh, Amelia has brought forth a good option with supporting advisory note. And then we also have to take into consideration the strategic planning um, based with the NISA 2020 plan that has been ratified. And it is, I agree with Councillor Wigner, the only opportunity at the material change of use to um, put conditions around that. So it's a, um, yeah, there's a lot of things to consider. Thank you. One more question if I can, please. <laughs> Um, if, the, if the excluding factor in this particular amendment is the time frame over which these works, this rehabilitation work has to take place, is it possible to move understanding orders, it's a question of the CEO, uh, another amendment which has a different time frame for these works to be achieved? There's two scenarios. This amendment is either successful or becomes part of the motion. And, and if it's lost. Do, mm. well, no, so there's two scenarios here. One is the amendment can be, might be successful and it becomes part of the motion. Someone can then move another further amendment including to the then condition 23. Conversely, if this motion is lost, someone could move another motion um, along the same lines of clause 23 uh, with additional wording. Thank you, Mr. Sear. Um, if this amendment gets passed, will it be precedent setting? Um, will we be telling anyone else in the hinterland who want to make an application for an MCU for STA that there could be onerous um, conditions placed on that application. Um, if, if council decides to include this condition on this application and uh, it remains on the notice, uh, despite representations potentially in the future by the applicant still remains on, officers will start to include that condition on all approvals for short term accommodation uh, in the hinterland for Lisa. Thank you. Just further that question, one would one would assume that would only apply to an application where a riparian area or a, a map waterway may exist on on a property rather, rather than just any SDA application. Would that not, not be the case? Yeah, certainly. That's sorry, that's what I meant. Any that's got similar circumstances, yeah. whether it's riparian areas or important vegetation, we would ask for the, a similar condition. So, Kerry, what areas are we referring to? Um, Kim Kim, Koran? Uh, all areas of the hinterland. So anything is mapped by the biodiversity overlay as being a riparian area or a waterway um, or an area of environmental significance. Yeah. So would this potentially be perceived as discriminatory or this not a... It's a bit of a leading. Yeah, okay. yeah that's... <laughs> yeah. Are there any other questions for Kerry before we vote on this motion? Oh, Councillor Stock, I beg your pardon. Of course, yes. you'll have a right. Thank you. It has been a good discussion. And while there is only one um, short stay accommodation venue in the hinterland, it has raised philosophical oh. questions. Hmm. And there's no one sitting around this table that doesn't support short stay accommodation and moving tourism to the hinterland. What we're debating about is should we use a development process to improve the environmental outcomes for the rest of the community? Should we use every material change of use to achieve a step towards the strategic outcomes? And if the answer to that is yes, then, then the reasonableness and rel relevance comes through. And I think there's been enough discussion around the table to say the, the uh, While well, the core of what I moved as an amendment is reasonable, is relevant, it's perhaps not reasonable. So I think Councillor Wilkie is heading down the path that it may be reasonable to require the progressive improvement of values adjacent to this map waterway over a period of years. We've talked about costs and we're through the debate and, and also with discussion with staff over recent months, 
the definition of rehabilitation within a development context is perhaps a quite a high hurdle, requiring operational works proof. Whereas I see actually that a progressive process of management of this waterway to remove environmental weeds and replace with natives should be a process that is much easier to achieve. So that's probably in the wording. But the heart of it is that we're dealing with a fairly good riparian corridor mapped in the biodiversity overlay, a remnant, plus a section of waterway that's mapped on the overlay code and a acceptable solution as outlined in our code in the planning scheme is that development provides for the rehabilitation of land within C, 10 metres either side of the centre line of a waterway identified on the biodiversity waterways and wetlands overlay map. So that's basically what this is asking for. But we, to me, I think there probably is a better solution that achieves the performance outcome. And to me, it might be something that um, the biodiversity, and this is a, a PO6, the, the performance outcome that that relates to is the biodiversity and ecosystem values of a waterway, wetland and adjacent riparian zones are protected by avoiding development, isn't it? It talks about avoiding edge effects, maintaining stream integrity, maintaining water quality, removing pest species and replacing them with locals. So to me, if this was not to succeed, the most appropriate sort of an amendment may be a new condition which says that council requires the applicant to improve the biodiversity and ecosystem values at 10 metres either side of the map waterway by removing pests and replacing them with local native species for over the next five years. I won't be voting for the amendment. All in favour of Council Stockwell's amendment? Against. It's unanimous. Thank you. Which brings us back to Council <laughs> Robinson's amendment. original amendment. I'll move another amendment. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> that an additional condition be added, number 23, uh, that the biodiversity and eco ecosystem values. <laughs> 10 metres either side of the map waterway yep. uh, be enhanced <coughs> over the next five years by removing pest species and so replacing just by down council for now. Five. <laughs> yep. Five. Removing pest species and replacing them with local native species. Is pest species the correct wording there? Would that be adequate? Or pest weed species? Do we need to be more specific mm. than... Ah. Oh. Well, if they've got pigs in there, they want to move, remove them as well. Okay. Right. Council Stockwell, would you... Oh, 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 I'll, I'll second it. Council yeah, Stockwell, would you like to speak to this? Oh, no, um, I'm arguing on Council Lawrence's behalf that this is a good outcome. <laughs> <laughs> And I agree with Councillor Stockwell, um, and I believe this condition should be relevant and reasonable, and a reasonable response to the changes that the development will cause. And I think it's a win-win um, to our economy and um, environment. I applaud the recommendation amendment. Councillor, are we um, sort of rewriting what the um, environmental team is is going to be doing now? It, do, do, re, making a sort of new game plan for giving approvals by through this council meeting right now. Can we that? <laughs> <laughs> um, in a word, yes. Um, you know, what what the council is doing is saying that in this uh, again, if this amendment is successful. What it's saying is that um, for these types of applications, you will be wanting applicants to work on improving their site over the next five years, rather than having to do it mm. all up front. Uh, and that's what staff would then have to look at building into this type of application or standard conditions for this type of application in the future as well. Question for Kerry. Is this a measurable and accessible condition that staff could deal with? What's that? <laughs> I'm trying to work out how to say no to <laughs> Uh, the original condition that we had is more measurable than this condition, but I think this is a reasonable response to where 
um, to ask for some works and improvements on the site without costing a significant amount of money for the applicant. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I, I like this wording because it gives the applicant the opportunity to engage with groups like Landcare, for example, and work out a way forward or approach council staff and work out a way forward without it being a hard mandated condition, which um, if we wanted to go that way, I think it's better to take the time to work out a, a standard condition. And this is not the forum to do that if we wanted to impose it more regularly going forward. I like this um, this one that's come out of a good discussion around the table about what we're all collectively trying to achieve in terms of uh, allowing the property owner to have a, a flourishing short-term accommodation business, which we know is good for the hinterland economy, and also protect the, the values that are, we seek to protect in the new planning scheme through the biodiversity waterways and wetlands overlays. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Research. Look, I, I concur. I, I think that um, there is intent and there is um, uh, expectation in, uh, in what we are proposing here. I don't think it's an unreasonable condition to, to pose that somebody that is going to get a material gain and benefit by commercial activity uh, through an MCU has a condition placed upon them and the expectation to uh, enhance the environment upon which that uh, uh, that activity is undertaken I think is a reasonable expectation. Uh, I think this is a far more um, reasonable ways and means of presenting that to the applicant. I'm just concerned that uh, it doesn't, uh, apart from pulling two weeds and planting one tree, I've enhanced, I've enhanced the uh, map waterway over that the situation. So I'm, I'm concerned that it doesn't, uh, it go, doesn't go far enough. But I, 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 I accept that the intent is there, and I think it gives intent to the uh, to applicants that there is an expectation that if they're going to undertake commercial activities like SDAs on their land, that they should, and, and that the uh, the the people coming to uh, stay at that SDA have an expectation that the uh, the land is going to meet the Noosa uh, environmental expectations. That they're going to not come to a weed infested property, but they're going to come to one that's been, you know, at least is making the effort to rehabilitate and to remove weeds and to enhance the environment that they're coming to stay in. So um, I commend uh, uh, the uh, the condition, and uh, I hope that it does sufficient to in the minds of the applicant to make them realise that. Uh, there is work to be done for the next five years. Thank you, Councillor Councillor. It seems wishy-washy, you guys. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a goal. It's, that's our goal. It's our clear goal. How do we get to that goal? What is the directives? It, 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 does it have teeth? Does it have direction? Does it have detail? It's a terrific goal, but I don't think it's any different or not much different than Amelia's um, uh, advisory note. I guess it is, but there, there's... We, I think we need a, a program to back up. This is it's a great amendment, but it seems like it needs to be a program set to make this work um, properly uh, with, with 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 the program with with, it, with so people know what they what they have to do. It's a good. It's a great goal. Thanks. Question: then. Could we go back to how having an operational plan that is over five years? Um, you, you could amend the condition again to still require an operational works application. Yes, yes. and the, the time frame we could write into the condition to give them five years to undertake those works. Okay. So would that satisfy Tom's question around this is a bit wishy-washy, will that give us something more strategic and more clarity for the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Um, yeah, my advice was that the previous condition 23, as we've worded, was much more measurable than this one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I thought this was a, a reasonable position to take for the proposal, but that's for council to decide. Mm -hmm. Councillor Vincent, would you like to speak to this motion? Can I amend? Do we have to vote on that before we make no, question? Remember, you might recall under our standing yep. orders that um, when you have a, an amendment, you cannot amend an amendment. So we the vote amendment, on this. Amendment gets mm -hmm. voted on. And then we raise and another amendment. Okay, let's do that. Would you like to speak to this amendment? 
No, do I need to say you don't have to? Well, do I need to say you don't have to? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, do you want to? I'll, I'll close. Would you, you like to close? Thank yeah. you, Councillor. Um, well. Once again, the debate's been really good. Um, I think it would be good to adopt this, but also some amendments, um, perhaps um, by inserting the words by removing all pest species and replacing them with local native species, um, and to do that progressively, providing annual reports on progress, something like to that effect. Thanks. We might vote on this amendment. All in favour? That's councillors Jurisovich, Stockwell, Wilkie, Stewart against, Wegner, Finzel. You voted against this amendment. Yep. You just get that you're against. Oh, so amendment. you're amending this amendment. No. So we get that we oh, get that motion sorry, and then no, amend it. I'm for. You're for. Okay, so excuse excuse me. We'll, we'll, we'll call that again. Sorry. Um, okay. All in favour of Councillor Stockwell's yeah. amendment. Councillors Drusevich, Stockwell, Wegner, Lawrenston, Stewart against. Is, yeah. it, is this one here, not the original one? This is the one this here. Councillor Stockwell's justice amendment. Yeah. yeah. I'll just say well, I'm against that. Okay, against no, Councillor I mean Finzel yeah. and Councillor Wegner. Okay. That's carried. Thank you, Carly. That forms okay. part of the original. I'll move a subsequent amendment. <laughs> <laughs> and in the spirit of amendments <laughs> on the run. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and to read, be enhanced over the next five years by progressively removing all peace pest species and replacing them with local native species, providing an annual progress report to council. I'll second it. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, no, I think that both Councillor Jurisovic and Wishy Washy Councillor <laughs> uh, had a point. <laughs> Would anyone like to speak to Amendment Number Three? Um, Kerry, when we say all pest species, yeah, that one, mm. is that is that possible? <laughs> I mean, is it is that is that is that good direction <laughs> to give? On the fly. <laughs> Yeah. It's a nice objective, <laughs> um, but it's perhaps um, not possible to achieve. But yeah. It's a yeah, nice objective. Yeah, so, you know, we could leave the condition as an objective, and that's how we can interpret it. Mm -hmm. I'd be comfortable with that. Yeah. Is that because there's likely to be a, a fly <laughs> buzzing around the site or <laughs> some, Something like some that. insect that's yeah. not native? It provides a target. Yeah, it's aspirational. Would anyone like to ask any more questions or speak to this amendment number three? Um, I have a question. Annual progress report. Um, will that be subject to um, satisfaction of council officers? I, I'm wondering um, what's the KPI? Is there, is there a KPI? Um, this is why you don't do things on the run, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> You always that question. <laughs> I just don't understand the point of a report unless it's measured against something. Going back to Tom's point here, uh, the condition could certainly be improved by adding those words to the reasonable satisfaction of council at the end. Yeah. Okay. Brian, can you add that? No. Well, I don't think our standing orders allow us to do that anymore. So what are we? So, would anyone else like to speak to this amendment? Uh, well, I'll, I'll speak to it. Yeah, I, I, uh, whilst I appreciate, again, I appreciate what Councillor Stockwell's trying to do. He's trying to do amendments on the run. Adding the word all challenges me because that suggests that um, weed removal is, uh, is forever and um, uh, that, that, that anyone can actually achieve a complete removal of all pest species on a site or in an area uh, uh, is, is aspirational. But, uh, not necessarily achievable, mm. uh, and replace uh, an annual progress report to council is it becomes quite quite onerous. Sure, uh, uh, but I appreciate that it doesn't have to be a particularly uh, uh, you know the level of detail in the progress report again to council mm. on, on how that's uh, worded. Uh, I see that we've uh, potentially come up with a uh, um, uh, some some additional wording for the further amendment. So uh, as it stands, I'm not prepared to uh, 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 support it because I don't think there is sufficient detail in there. <laughs> Even though I like the intent of it, I think at least to have one more go, right? <laughs> Start thinking, Brian. I'm only going to support it on the proviso that it's progressively um, improved. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Um, 
Can I ask whether we could get the advice of the CEO with the wording? Are you... Might 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 save us twenty minutes. Actually, I I have another another question. Uh, is there um, uh, a time restraint on this, or could we? Is there the potential to defer this so that we may uh, look at um, uh, correcting the wording with uh, some staff advice? My advice is to resolve it this evening. Correct. Uh, we've got an applicant who's waiting for a decision. The wording you need to be right by advice to council will always assist when you try and do things on the fly, that's where you get into trouble. Yep. We've yep. that before. Um, so let's get the wording right before we yeah. finalise and move on to a debate. Councillor Stockwell, do you want to have a reply? Uh, only to say that it does need a bit of refinement. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll put this amendment to a vote all in favour. Councillor Stockwell, against. Councillors Drusevich, Finzel, Councillor. Wilkie, Wegner, Lawrenston and Stewart uh, lost. Thank you. You want to have another quick problem? Mm. <laughs> um, can, I, can I assist council? <laughs> Please. I think the word remove and c or control listed pest species. So can I just perhaps ask a question or two just so we, otherwise we're going to have another four or mm. five to go. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. It's my understanding of council, sorry, it's my understanding of council looking for something that would enable you to um, ensure that over the next five years, some work's done on this, but there's some certainty about what's going to be happening there. And maybe Kerry, from your perspective, to be able to then enforce this condition or have this condition um, that has <coughs> certainty about it, what would be the key issues that you would need to be able to see into that? Um, to be a, yeah, uh, well, I think um, Councillor Brown was pretty well there, but I would add to the reasonable satisfaction of Council, it gives us a little bit of um, control yeah, over. Yeah the work that occurs, so I think that goes a long way to addressing what occurs. We probably can't remove all, I think uh, Councillor Brown was talking about removing or control. Or controlling. Yeah. Or pest species. We yeah, I would remove the word all, that would, that, would, that would work for me. Listed pest species. Significant. Because you need a benchmark. Yeah, listed. Listed. Yes. In our biodiversity, in our... Yeah, that's our, a good idea. Yeah. Writing an annual progress to the research. I think, I think, I think that would give you more certainty in terms of what would be um, enforceable to be able to come back to council. Okay. Yeah, I think it looks good. Can I move it? I'll move that. Thank you, Councillor George. I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> If only you take the fire out of council's councillor Stockwell's chapel. <laughs> no, I think uh, I think the uh, the matter's been debated. I think we've come to a, a reasonable condition that uh, uh, I think all councillors can. Uh, Before we go on, you um, you uh, oh, the original motion. Okay. So just need yeah, to sorry, second. 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 Good point. Good point. Councillor Pinzel, you said did you oh, second it? Yeah. You Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, look, I, I think the intent was uh, was well uh, well intentioned, but the uh, uh, a long winded way of getting to uh, to the uh, final result. I think uh, uh, what Council Stockwell was uh, attempting here was uh, again well intentioned, well meaning, but I think this is a reasonable way of uh, of achieving that result. Uh, the expectation of moving always progressively removing controlling listed pest species, I think, is uh, is a far better way of wording it and. Uh, uh, an annual report to acknowledge that, they're, that it's being undertaken and that the council can see that the work's being undertaken, I think, is a, a fair reasonable outcome. Thank you, Councillor Drusevich. Anyone else like to speak to this? Did I hear right that Councillor Drusevich says that I was long winded? Would anyone else like to speak now? Whoever holds your place. No? Okay, we might put amendment number four to a vote. All in favour? You know, thank you, Kyle. That can get your original. Um, thank you, Joe. <laughs> 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 yeah. So brings us to the original. Now, yeah, Councillor Lawrence and Councillor Council Wilkie have spoken to that mm -hmm. the original motion. So, and not all councils need to speak to it if you don't wish to. <laughs> would anyone else yeah. speak to the original? I can't remember what the original motion was. <laughs> With the uh, decision, of the inclusion of the decision notice, the advisory note. And trial, I also inserted the trial period for yeah. outdoor noise. Yeah. Yeah. Would anyone like to speak? Yeah, look, I'll just, just reiterate a, a point raised through, um, through the debate that, uh, that I said. Uh, Council Stockwell is right, you know, uh, at the, an MCU is an opportunity for us to, uh, to, to look at uh, the application. Had this been 
uh, an Airbnb off the off the cuff that was being built on the site. I don't think it would have been an unreasonable expectation to, to, to look at that. The fact that the, the, the use is changing, I think, it gives us that uh, that same expectation. To look at the use on the site, the, the fact that there is a, the, a material change of use, and the opportunity here to uh, to not only control the uh, the uh, short stay uh, elements of it, but any other any other issues. Now I note that uh, you know, along with this, staff have taken the opportunity to turn around and see what compliance issues there are on site, and making sure that all compliances have, uh, have been adhered to uh, on site from building regulations. So there is those opportunities to turn around and make sure that. Um, that uh, the property does comply fully before uh, uh, approving the use, and I think this is a. Uh, I know that uh, 23 was a bit long-winded, and uh, and we got there in the end. But I think uh, adding the condition of 23 is a fair and reasonable outcome to uh, to have an expectation that if there are weed management issues on the site and a, a proliferation of weeds, that we have an expectation that we have to deal with them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else like to speak to this? All right, we might quit for. Yeah, or, oh, sorry, be part of my reply, Councillor Langston. Um, no, I thank all the councillors for really good debate. We have arrived at what I think is reasonable and relevant conditions. Um, and I also want to note that um, we have demonstrated that we actually are understanding the implications yeah. of our decisions yeah. and the implications to the hinterland and um, <coughs> to the Shire. So um, thank you, councillors. Proud to be sitting at this table. Great. All in favour. Yes. Okay. Oh. Item two. <laughs> <laughs> Page twelve. R A L of thirty five. R A L twenty slash zero zero one nine. Application for re reconfiguration of a lot, one lot into two lots, and creation of an access easement at twenty three Jerima Jir Crescent Croy Bar. This is the subject of a further report later in the meeting, guys. Yeah. Item three, MCU 19 slash 0081, Planning and Environment Court Appeal number D176 of 2019, refusal of application for 16 ancillary dwelling units at 64 Gateway Drive, Noosa Bill. This item was deferred to the ordinary meeting so staff could provide us with additional conditions. These have been circulated to councillors, so we'll deal with this item now. Are there any questions for Kerry? Um, Kerry, is home hosting permitted under the current scheme or old scheme in industrial states? Uh, no, it's not. And can this be challenged given that um, the locality of this particular um, building is in what is described as an enterprise precinct. Does that change the definition or use in any way? Um, so that the applicants applied for ancillary dwelling units, so that they can't use ancillary dwelling units for home hosted. They would have to make an application for another use to do home hosted and council would look, need to look at that and reassess that afresh. So it would have to be a separate application. They're not able to do it through this Proposed settlement. So I'd like to move an amendment. Um, I'd like to move an amendment, sorry. It's a motion, but it's amending the recommendation. Are there the recommendations we put through? Yeah. Yeah, that's so a motion. Can I read? And maybe just read out the, the yeah. changes from. The changes, um, number four, the ancillary dwelling units are not permitted to be used for bed and breakfast accommodation and or short term accommodation. And I think you wanted to also add the advisory note. That was Brian's um, addition, B, to include the following advisory note on the decision notice that the proposed ancillary units are located in an area that is zoned low impact industry under the Noosa Plan 2020 and a range of industrial uses are planned to establish them. <coughs> may generate noise, odour, dust, waste nuisance or the like. These industrial businesses will not be required to include additional measures to address the potential impacts from these industrial uses on the dwelling unit, units given they should reason, reasonably be expected. I'll second. Thank you. 
Um, well, Kerry, you've just said that um, home hosting is not permitted under the old or new scheme. Um, I still thought it's important that we have that included as a condition, so we remove all doubt um, that the permitted use of an ancillary dwelling is that it can't be let out independently of the industrial <coughs> use conducted on the lower level. Um, and I also wanted to highlight that we have a shortage in housing supply and not a shortage in short-term accommodation. So I, um, although this didn't come in our favour, I think the opportunity there is that it is going to be providing some housing supply and some housing choices for our residents. <coughs> yeah, so it's an interesting place we find ourselves. We refused this based on we thought the development was by proxy creating multiple units. Uh, we tested that concept in court and the judge didn't agree with us. The judge says it could be developed, could be considered multiple units, but due to the technical definition of what constitutes a premises, it could be considered 16 separate ancillary dwelling units. So because we lost that argument, that the judge says, no, you can look at each individual building unit and say it's one ancillary unit, we are in a position that our case is a difficult one to proceed with. So while it's probably an application that has um, tried to use a loophole to create a whole lot of residential dwellings, We've conditioned it such that it's clear what their purpose is for. So a person can't buy one of these and just live upstairs. You can't just live upstairs. You can't park your caravan underneath and say that's an industry. You must be doing an industry. So in that way, providing the conditions are met, I hope it does lead to a whole lot of people with small industries who uh, can both live and work in the one place. That wouldn't be a bad outcome. What the advisory note is that what we found, and one of the reasons why we tightened up on this in the new planning scheme, was that people going and, and getting caretakers approved, and then the caretakers complained that someone's actually had the height to create noise and smells next door in an industrial estate. So this has said, if you're buying this, buy beware. Um, this is what you can expect. If you complain to us about any of those one things, we'll put it on the list, and it'll be at the very bottom of the list, unlikely to get any higher. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Stroud. Oh. Yeah. The same thing I'm disappointed with where the uh, where the um, uh, the court took this one is uh, would be an understatement. Uh, the, the, the purpose of uh, the ancillary unit was to be a caretaker's cottage, caretaker to overlook uh, uh, overlook the entire complex. I could understand, but a, a caretaker to understand. Each of sixteen un each of sixteen units in a twenty eight unit complex, all of which overlook the uh, the the lake and the uh, the um, uh, environmental area at the rear. Um, sort of has me scratching my head a bit, uh, but uh, it is what it is. What's before us? At least we've conditioned uh, the uh, the uses accordingly. And uh, as Councillor Scottwell has alluded, that uh, there is no expectation of, uh, of people living in these units. Uh, uh, having uh, industrial uses around them and uh, capacity to play, but also that the use goes with the premises. So that uh, I do see there is a potential here for uh, an element of positive outcome. We have uh, talked about shop top housing in, uh, in commercial precincts. In a, in a way, this is a similar type of uh, type of scheme, but it means that uh, perhaps a business can uh, live upstairs and work downstairs in amongst other other like-minded businesses and uh, and have that that capacity so um, acknowledged tolerated uh, not necessarily um, genuinely uh, expected or um, or preferred um. in a way I'm, I'm curious to see how this develops over the next uh, five years uh, to take the enterprise precinct we have people in there these are the conditions the court said that we can't do it but anyways let's let's just try to learn from this and um, maybe who knows there might be there might be a good outcome despite our, our thoughts right now 
Yeah, thank you. I um, thank Councillor Lawrence and Councillor Stockwell for those con those additions to the conditions. I think that they were Im important to, to stipulate mm. and to specify, uh, and I think they're good ones. And, and I'm hopeful too, as Councillor Stockwell said, that people who are actually living in these industries, working in these industries, and if they need accommodation, they make use of that um, upstairs. We can effectively say we're potentially providing or housing 16 people, which is a good thing, as we know we're at an affordable housing crisis. Uh, and I think it's a great addition to say, um, you know, buy beware, as Councillor Stockwell said, if you want to live here, this, these are the conditions that you must live under, taking into account the noise, the pollution. And as Councillor Lawrence said, good again to stipulate about sh no short-term letting, no home hosted. Uh, although that's, as Kerry said, that, that's part of the conditions. It's good to have it stated and it's good to have that on record for our community as well. So thank you everyone for those additions and those conditions. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I would just like to add that um, I think we could look at this as an opportunity. I think particularly uh, with arts, culture and heritage, who knows if this develops into a precinct where we have artists working together in collaboration and supporting one another for outcomes that um, enhance and promote that industry and also providing great opportunity for shared resources, perhaps around technology or other things. So I think um, the conditions that we've put on are good. Thank you to the councillors that have raised them, but I see it um, as an opportunity considering that Fundamentally, we've been changed how business is done due to COVID and how we look towards a brighter future. Thank you. No, thank you. Put the motion to a vote. All in favour? Unanimous. Thank you. Please <coughs> to item number four, which is very similar. Planning Environment Court Appeal number... D one zero two of twenty twenty refusal of ancillary dwelling unit at one slash thirty three Gateway Drive in Seville. This item is also deferred to the ordinary <coughs> meeting, so staff could provide us with additional conditions. Does anyone have any questions for Kerry? I'll, I'll, I'll move the motion. I'll second it. Thank you. Look, I think we've just dealt with it. Um, the mirror reversal has just been at number four, so I think there's no need to rehash. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this motion? Okay. Yeah, just to clarify for the sake of those listening, if the, or, uh, were these a condition uh, that have been added here uh, in the previous uh, um, uh, recommendation before us, or have they been added here uh, today, uh, Madam Chair? These are the same conditions, Councillor Drusso, which has the previous yeah, they weren't on this. They weren't on this prior, so I'm just wondering whether they, just to clarify whether they were on the uh, on the agenda before when the agenda was received and as as written, or they. I, I received. The you know, I know we've circulated like, for the purposes of the people that are watching that everybody understands that those conditions have been added is what I'm I'm referring to. Yeah, I think Councillor Drusso's question is that um, the two extra conditions that. Councillor um, Amelia read out before in relation to the previous application, the same two conditions were applied here mm. as well. So they, they weren't previously yeah, that, 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 yeah, that, that, that the same way. Yeah, yeah. That, that it's understood that they've been added in this. In, in, in this yes. I won't, anyone else to speak? Okay. I won't wave my word or reply. All in favour? Unanimous. Thank you. Item number five noosa bushland reserve strategic management plan this item was deferred to the ordinary meeting and is the subject of a further report later in the meeting item six noosa bushland reserve strategic fire management plan 2021 item seven noosa biosphere reserve foundation new partnership agreement 2021 to 2025 this item was deferred to the ordinary meeting to allow us to hold a workshop yesterday to garnish further information. And so we'll deal with this item now. Are there any questions for Craig? Thank you for coming up to the table. Um, I'll, I'll second the motion. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor. <coughs> Changes to C and D that the four questions. 
Um, I'm adding the additions of, or the motion in place is that Council note the report by the Environmental Services Manager to the Planning and Environmental Committee meeting dated 8th of June 2021 and agree to enter into a four year partnership agreement with the Noosa Biosphere Reserve Foundation from the 1st of July 2021 as set out in attachment one to the report. Authorise the Chief Executive Officer to make any minor alterations to the partnership agreement as may be necessary and enter into the partnership agreement with the Foundation. C. Request the Noosa Biosphere Reserve Foundation to seek more female representation on its board, taking into account the relevant and necessary experience that is required by the board, by that board, and D. Accept Noosa Biosphere Reserve Foundation's offer to place their internal governance policies on their website. Um, look, I, I, may, I thank, thank you to Councillor Wilkie, who D was, I believe, brought up at the General Council me Committee meeting on uh, Monday, and um, and very kind of the, the Noosa Biosphere Reserve Foundation to make that offer to put their internal governance policies on their web website. I think that creates greater transparency, and I think it's a good move. In regard to C, when I did some research quickly, I note that there's currently eight board members on the Noosa Biosphere Reserve Foundation, Councillor Wigan being one of them, and they're all male. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that it is time to have some female representation on the board. When I looked at the Australian Institute of Company Directors and I looked at some research, women on um, the ASX 200 companies, women on boards of these companies have increased by two points in the last year, bringing it up to 32.1%. So 32.1% of board directors on ASX 200 <coughs> companies are women. That's three out of 10. Right now, with the Noosa Biosphere, we're at zero out of eight. So I think we can do better. I think it's an opportunity to, to do better. And as we enter into a new funding agreement, a new partnership agreement, sorry, should I say, uh, it's, it's an opportunity to really, to drive that forward, to drive the recognition of women um, mm. forward. And I think it's it's a good thing. And I think it's something that this community, as we, we you know, the River Stakeholder Advisory Group was a good example. The community wanted women, they wanted representation, they wanted equal and fair representation. Now, I'm not saying have eight women on the board, but I'm saying we can do better than having zero women on the mm. board. So that's why I've moved this amendment to include the and the women being a part of this um, foundation. And I know there had been a woman on this board previously, and she uh, resigned earlier last year. So I'd like to see another woman step up. And I don't think it should just be, you're a woman, you're on the board. Board members, as we've heard, have significant credentials and are very well um, resourced in regard to their intellectual knowledge <coughs> about all things environmental. And they have a lot of university ties. So mm. I know that there are a lot of women out there who have those credentials. So I'd like to see them to be a part of the, the board going forward. Uh, whether or not that happens, over the next 12 months, 18 months, but I think it should be noted and I think it should certainly be aspirational and I think it's something we should all work towards. Thank you. Nick, can I speak to the motion? Yes. Yeah. Be being on the board, of course, um, as was pointed out by Rex earlier, um, that I'm a male, there's three new um, female councillors. One of them could have got on the board, but I really, really, really wanted that position on the board. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we, we did make a motion to this. Um, in March, um, Duncan, a board me member, proposed board commits to an equitable, equitable gender diversity by 2025, implementing a plan to achieve this target. Concern was raised about the committee to a quota or a set male-female percentage split. The board is committed to a gender <laughs> equality, however, it recognizes that this is a complex process to achieve fairly. So this is, this is in the minutes. So the motion was the board commits to achieving an equitable, equitable gender diversity by 2025. The board commits to developing and implementing a plan to achieve this 2025 target. And this was passed. So it, it's been hot on the topic and, um, and it's definitely been, been recognized by the board and it's just a, a, a fluke that there's eight, eight men. And uh, I'm sure that they're looking to address that. Thank you, Councillor Wigner. Anyone else like to speak to this motion? Councillor Joe. Oh, look, I'll commend the Mayor on, uh, on adding condition C. I uh, go even one step further to ensure that diversity is a key point on any board and any uh, representation. That, uh, diversity of gender as well as uh, uh, a range of other uh, diversities that, that can be considered there, including uh, Indigenous representation, of course. Mm. 
Uh, I'll speak about more to point A, uh, agree to enter in the four-year partnership uh, with the Noosa Biosphere Reserve Foundation. I think what this does is uh, show that we've uh, reached a level of maturity and understanding of the Noosa Reserve, uh, Biosphere Reserve and uh, the work that the Foundation is doing. We uh, acknowledge that uh, the, the outcomes that the, uh, that the Reserve Foundation is, uh, is achieving are uh, to be commended and to be uh, continue to be uh, supported uh, and entering into a four-year partnership that uh, more closely aligns with, uh, uh, that as Craig has undertaken here, to more uh, closely align with the uh, political um, uh, term uh, is, is quite a good outcome. Uh, I think uh, uh, to Rex and his team and, uh, and the work they've been doing uh, to, to date uh, and the uh, projects they've brought forward have been ones that this uh, community can well be proud of and uh, we'll ex expect great, uh, great outcomes of and I look forward to the next uh, array of uh, offerings that uh, the Biosphere Reserve Foundation uh, continue to bring to this community. Thank you, Councillor Speech. <laughs> Councillor Stockwell. Yeah, briefly, um, being acknowledged by UNESCO uh, internationally as a Biosphere Reserve is a, a really uh, big step in the history of this show. Setting up the Nusa Biosphere Reserve Foundation was a key step in getting others involved in meeting our obligations and to maintain that endorsement and to keep on, more importantly, keep on learning. You know, a big part of the UNESCO Biosphere Program is about the living laboratory. So what this uh, agreement does, it actually provides a little bit more in that regard, suggesting that operational funding is not just administrative funding. It is potentially being allocated to be able to hold symposiums or provide the funds to hold symposiums to look at getting uh, the, the multidisciplinary knowledge around the table to address key issues that the biosphere is facing. It talks about the potential uh, to enter into um, a science brokerage arrangement so to get them get the biosphere to work on behalf of council to go out and access the research we need to address problems so to me this is another step on the way and i think it's a, well, we also need to uh, acknowledge that it really is a vote of endorsement of the work that the biosphere reserve foundation has been doing and the quality that they bring to the task thank you council stockwell I'll ask a question, okay? Um, what are the risks risk that are involved in the partnership and how will these be managed? And are there any risk? No, I think any time we enter a partnership, there's risks that one party or the other won't hold up their end of the bargain. The key action we've taken to mitigate risk with regards to this agreement is to not actually have any guaranteed funding within the agreement. So year in, council will make a decision based on NBRF's performance on whether and how much to fund them for the following year. So that's been the key action different to the previous agreements that have been undertaken to mitigate any risk to council. Can, can, oh, sorry, um, Craig, it would be fair, just under the Partnership Act 1891, can you confirm that this is not a legal partnership, so we're not liable for each other in any way, being council and the, the biosphere? Foundation? Yes, I can. We identified that as a risk and we sought specific legal advice from King & Co on that matter, who instructed that the current agreement did not meet that, but they also, just to remove any doubt, provided some recommended wording that we adopted to make it even clearer. Thank you. <coughs> um, have we included review provisions to evaluate and monitor the success of the partnership? Um, there's a series of specific things that need to be reported against against the in the annual report, which includes uh, the return on investment, um, so the ratio of investment depending on what council for their projects they deliver, um, also around their community engagement um, and media presence, and also around the success they have in delivering their projects on time. So when that's reported in the annual report, that gives council an opportunity to, to I guess, decide whether or not the project has been worth the, the partnership continues to be worthwhile. Um, would you please be able to clarify the difference between the partnership agreement and the funding deed to explain how uh, the change seeks to more accurately reflect the working of the relationship between the NRBF and Council? Um, there's no legal difference between the two, pending our advice. 
But the term funding deed dates back to the two previous agreements where council specifically provided allocated funding to NBOF. So we didn't feel that funding deed was an appropriate name for this. Um, so we came with the term partnership agreement because that's the way we envision and the way in practice council's been working with NBOF, particularly over the last couple of years. So um, we feel that rather than council being a financial provider to NBRF to go off and do their thing, we actually feel that particularly through Councillor Wegner sitting on the board, that we're actively involved and in working with NBRF to deliver outcomes, which to my mind is a partnership. Thank you. And how will this impact the operational plans, budget and um, KPIs that were considered not relevant moving forward? Um, that they're still existing in the document. They're sitting there to be reported on in the annual operational plan. So none of the KPIs from the previous agreement have gone. They're all sitting there. They're just not being called KPIs because we didn't feel they were actually KPIs. Uh, functionally, the way they're used will pretty much be exactly the same. NBRF will report against those criteria that's in the agreement as part of their annual plan. Uh, and then council will be able to use the success of otherwise of those reporting indicators to be able to make financial decisions on budget allocation. I'll probably just add to that the um, report that NBRF is required to provide will come to the council at a council meeting, and that report will be as part of the council agenda as well, so the committee gets to see what um, what that report is. Yeah. Craig, can you confirm that the, there's no money um, trans, there's no agreement for any funding in regard to this partnership agreement, and that's a purely separate matter, so it's, it's merely is a partnership agreement. It is, that's correct. The only funding that can be allocated can be allocated either by council as part of its normal budget uh, decision during the budget process. Thank you. Um, can application be made under the operational plan for any type of funding between, say, 5000 and 15000 um, Application could be made under NBRF's operational plan, which they must provide to us by the end of February for council to consider as part of the budget cycle for anything that meets the definition of operational expenses within the agreement. They cannot provide anything that does not meet that definition or would be considered a project because that's considered outside the scope of funding. Thank you. Um, Craig, aside from the four-year cycle to align with local government elections, what specific goals are you aiming for to provide certainty for the relationship? Um, I don't know that I have specific goals. Um, certainly for the relationship is about us continuing to grow and work with NBRF and ensuring that through our representation on the board that NBRF is pulling in the same direction as Council. Um, since the last agreement, obviously Council endorsed the Noosa Environment Strategy, which not only is influencing the way we work as a Council, we expect it to influence the way NBRF works as well. Um, for the first time in this agreement, we require an operational plan each year. Previously, all we've required is a request, a funding request. We're now saying our expectation is the NBRF comes to us, not just with a request for funding, but actually what they're going to spend that funding on. And that assists, assists us to align it with our environment strategy. So would you say the conditions are now are more arduous for in, um, the Noosa Biosphere Reserve Foundation? There's more that they, they're more accountable now under this, this agreement than previously? Um, I think that's clearly the case because both of the previous agreements have provided guaranteed funding. The previous agreement just for the first year, the <coughs> agreement before that for three years. So while arduous implies a negativity, mm. I think it just simply explains that the gradual evolution of NBRF and the relationship and their organisation, that both sides are happy with this change. We actually see it as part of the movement of NBRF forward. Thanks. I'll probably just add to that, um, to me, this third agreement probably reflects the maturity of the mm. relationship and the maturity of the model as well, um, which is also why it's probably moving from a funding agreement to a partnership agreement, but also why it's moving from a three-year agreement to a four-year agreement. There's probably we're more comfort about that relationship and how that works and, and the control of the council really sits around that. Um, there is no obligation to provide funding as part of that uh, ongoing performance and the annual um, process to look at that funding is through the budget process. Thank you. Thank you. Craig, given this is the third reiteration of mm -hmm. this agreement, um, for clarity, how is acquittal of funds undertaken and what is to be included in the submitted written reports back to Council to meet Council's acquittal requirements? Just bear with me for a moment while I grab the relevant section of the agreement. Um, that should be 6.2b, that's my recollection. Uh, yeah, so under the current agreement, under section 6.2, 
um, there's a several criteria there around performance reporting. Um, so it states they must report on NBRF activities and <coughs> meet council's equitable requirements, including, but not necessarily limited to, provision of a six monthly report against utilisation of the funding towards the operational plan or as otherwise required by council. Um, provide an annual report for each financial year when submitted to council no later than 30th of November or within 30 days of the AGM, which shall include leave we can achieve from council funding to NBRF, calculated as a total of funded projects compared with council approved project funding, growth in donations as a deductible gift recipient, percentage of projects completed within the target time frame, and a range of communications utilised and estimated audience reached. They must also provide an audited financial report for each financial year and submit it no later than 30th of November. And these reports are provided to council, to a council meeting uh, and placed on the public record. There's also requirements that if council requests it, uh, they must provide ad hoc reports within 30 days of any such request. That could come as a direction from council or from a council officer, would be my interpretation of that. Um, and they could relate to any significant developments concerning the program or any delays or difficulties. Um, so those are the conditions in the agreement. Thank you, Craig. Just to follow on from that, Craig, um, what would happen with any unspent funds or any request for additional funds? Should be required. Um, any request for additional funds would come to a council meeting. There's no provision within this agreement to provide additional funds to NBRF. Um, there are some conditions around unspent funding. Um, okay, um, under section 7, um, 7.1 7 and 7.2, there are various conditions around the management of council funding. Um, and those relate to the failure to comply with the agreement. Um, so um, there's several provisions there that if Embryo fails to remedy uh, sorry, fail, fails to remedy a failure to comply with the agreement in substantial respect within 30 days, um, NBRF must, on demand from council, repay council the whole amount of unspent funding for that financial year. Oh, thank you. Um, just in reference to the partnership, um, why is this not a strategic alliance? The NBRF have no power to bind or represent council. Parties in the agreement are not carrying on a business in common with a view to profit. So just for, by way of clarity and for the viewers, can you explain why we um, put this agreement under partnership um, and not a strategic alliance? And, uh, it, it, and what's better for growth, a partnership or an alliance? Um. I'll be honest, we did not really consider the wording to that level of the extent. Oh, okay. uh, it was made very clear, so long as it wasn't a partnership in the legal sense of a partnership, to us it seemed quite appropriate. We could have called it a strategic alliance, that wouldn't have been unreasonable. Uh, this actually felt a little bit more plain language, if you like, a little bit more user friendly. I'll probably just add to that. Um, the, the lawyers or ex lawyers around the room probably recognise that partnership can have a special meaning and, and special legal obligation. Um, but to the layperson out there, partnership means a, a, a good working relationship. And I think that reflects what this is about. And we needed to make sure, and we got that legal advice that we didn't step over that line and form what are called a legal partnership type arrangement. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no risk there for council, but it does reflect what the, the ordinary person um, understanding of the word partnership is, how you work together to get things done. Sorry, just a clarify my question, my question earlier. I, I, I appreciate that there's uh, wording in there that there's. Uh, uh, with regard to again, spend funds with regard to uh, failure of obligations and the like, but uh, I was more referring to um, should they be more prudent and uh, they haven't actually spent all the operational the funds. Does that also cover that uh, that element of it, or is that uh, an element that gets returned at the end of financial year, or can they carry that over and and and, and request less in the next financial year? As uh, I need bank that bank those funds for for, for future provision. Thank you, Councillor. Sorry, 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 that's sorry, I was sorry, just, sorry, I was just yeah, getting, yeah, my, was just getting my wording right. Um, to me. So that's right. Un under uh, 7.2c, it states that if NBRF fails to spend the funding or part of it on the NBRF program, they are subject to the, they are subject to the clause liable to repay council the amount of unspent money, yeah. and the council may recover that money from NBRF due, right. as a debt due to council. I don't believe what you're asking is the specific intent no. of that clause. No. The no. intent of that clause is around if they spend it on something inappropriate. Um, previously, um, functionally, NBRF with their project funding have been able to roll that over, but with operational funding, if it was unspent, we've allocated less the following year. Okay, thank you. 
That's what that's what that was yeah. in general. Yeah. 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 Um, it's noted on page 98 of 119 of the report under the funding conditions. Uh, there's no mention made of the general requirements around community engagement. Question, how come there's no mention of community engagement under this section, given the proposed funding deed 21 to 25 agreement centres on continuing work with Noosa Community to develop education and research projects that enhance and align with UNESCO Band and Biosphere program goals? How is the community engagement measured? Um, you're correct, there is no mention under 6.1, but under 6.2 with performance reporting, um, one of the performance reporting criteria is around range of methods of communication utilised and estimated audience reached. Um, so there's a, um, there's a measure there for counts after NBRF to be specific, specifically reporting on the level of community engagement and the types of reach they're able to achieve. Mm. So how has this been made transparent to the community in the past? Um, with regards to NBRF broadly, their transparency, um, NBRF have an outstanding website. I don't think there's another community group in Noosa that has a more transparent and open website. Um, you can go on there today and find every project they've done over the last five years, the amount of cost, who contributed the funds, what the ratio was, and any report that came out of it is all listed very clearly and very easy to find. When I need to find research information, often the first spot I go is the NBRF, NBRF website. On there you'll also find their constitution, their trust documentation, their strategic plan and all their annual reports from 2017 to 18, which outline uh, the communications and outreach they've had into the community and also their audited financial statements for all the community to see. Um, Craig, there were some concerns in regards to membership that the NBRF is not open to um, everyone. My question is, was it actually set up in, my understanding, in 2015, it was set up by Noosa Council. Um, was it actually set up as a member-based community organisation or not? No, it wasn't. The Council adopted a model um, back there, and there was a lot of debate about this issue at the time. Um, but essentially the model was to have a foundation um, which, which acted as a, a use term think tank or, or strategic type approach. And there'd be a separate organisation dealing with um, broader based membership, um, which is a, an incorporated association. So that was the, the model that was set up by council, um, and that's been operating since that time. Any other speakers to this motion? Well, um, I'll, thank you, Craig. Thank you for all those well, questions. They were very thorough that your answers. Look, I think it's good to note that as as Craig has said this partnership, it's a partnership. It's a, as Brett said, it's a good working relationship. It's not a legally binding document. In no way are we implicated uh, or liable for Noosa Biosphere Reserve Foundation and likewise in no way are they liable to us. Uh, there is no guarantee for the community, there's no guaranteed funding under this partnership agreement. It is purely a good working relationship and it's a way forward. Again, it's where we want to head. Uh, I think it shows, as uh, our CEO said, a maturity of the relationship between Noosa Council and, and the Foundation. I think um, heartened to hear, Councillor Wegner, that there is uh, the motion put forward to include more women, because I think it's an important one. I think uh, certainly going forward, in the year we find ourselves in 2021, a board of all men is hard to justify. So I think the addition of women and uh, the, um, the, you know, the determination of, of the Foundation to include women is a great thing. And I think that the um, Reserve Foundation's own offer to place their internal governance policies on the website is also good. It increases transparency. And that's always a good thing for any organisation, uh, having the community more involved and to know more about it. And uh, so, yeah, I'm uh, happy to support this resolution. Thank you. Oh, I thought very good. All in favour. You know, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Moving on. We might. Um, would anyone like a five minute? It's restroom break. We might. We might take a break for five minutes. We have three other items on the agenda, and I can see one going for a little longer than the others. Um, Madam, Madam Mayor, um, 
We've got two more before we move the general committee. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah. That does make sense. Yes. So item eight, amendments to commercial use of community land policy and item nine, financial performance report, May 21. I move the general committee recommendations, madam. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Finzel, thank you. All in favour? Thank you. Well, we might have a five minute break. Unanimous? We might have a five minute break there. Yeah. Thank you.
Freeloading might be enough. Don't talk amongst yourself. All good. We're ready. All right. there we well, welcome back, everyone. Thank you. Uh, we're on to page 15 of the agenda, and this is reports direct to the ordinary meeting. Item one is the further report, RAL 20-0019, application for reconfiguration of a lot, one lot into two lots, and creation of an access easement at 23 Jurima Crescent, Kuroi Bar. Uh, this is the re further report requested at the General Committee, and we have our Development Assessment Manager here, Kerry. Um, does anyone have any questions for Kerry? I'd like to move a motion on staff recommendation, please. Thank you. I'll second that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, I beg your pardon. I'll retract that. Yeah. Yeah. We have a seconder. I'll second it for the debate. Yeah. Councillors, we um, I've had done some serious thinking about this, and we had a, a wide-ranging discussion on Monday about whether the waterway in question was a waterway or a wetland. Um, the staff is still divided on that. They said it is a water. It is still a waterway and a wetland. It, a waterway. A waterway. It is a waterway. There is a disagreement between the view opposed by um, uh, opposed by councillors at the table that it was a wetland rather than a waterway. Um, staff advice is it is a waterway. And if you turn to page twenty four. Um, on our Planning and Environment Committee agenda where it talks about performance outcomes. It says the biodiversity ecosystem values of waterways, wetlands and adjacent riparian zones, whether it's waterways or a wetland, um, are protected by a, avoiding any new development in a riparian buffer area and wetland area. And under acceptable outcomes, development and clearing of vegetation, vegetation does not occur within a riparian buffer area a wet or a wetland area. Um, uh, the, the fence line, the boundary line, is considered development under the planning scheme. So uh, we have refused a lot of other developments because, um, development applications, because they have developments, they propose works or developments, some form of development works within a riparian buffer zone. Gem Life is for one, and there's an appeal pending about that, and that would be one of the key arguments for our defence of that appeal. If we start uh, um, approving subdivisions that, in, or any sort of development application that involves works that will either um, impinge, uh, uh, go, uh, that uh, bisect or impinge or affect in any way a riparian buffer area, it really weakens our um, it weakens the planning scheme. It weakens the preferred the performance outcomes, the acceptable outcomes of the planning scheme, and. Uh, I want to have my name on this app, on voting in favour of this recommendation because I don't want an, my name on an alternative recommendation that's going to be used in a court case about where the Noosa Council approved a development that involved um, works that impinged on or bisected a riparian, um, a riparian zone. The only reason we were one of the main reasons we were successful in defending a court case against the Queensland Investment Corporation, which is effectively the state government, was that um, we have been consistent in um, upholding the uh, the Noosa planning scheme, and that means performance outcomes and acceptable outcomes of the Noosa planning scheme. I don't want this to be the decision that sent the Noosa Council down the wrong track. I acknowledge the expertise of a councillor, Councillor Stockwell, who is at this table. He has extensive experience as a town planner. But his view is still in conflict. His opinion is still in conflict with our professional staff. And when you have that internal dissension, what I'm worried about is unintended consequences for a range of other, other um, uh, decisions down the track. We're already getting um, applications as um, the... the um, uh, demand for land, the uh, developable land becomes higher because of scarcity. We're getting a lot of applications that are pushing the boundaries and uh, staff are having to uh, con continually guide um, applicants in the right direction. We're going to be more and more having to defend these marginal applications. We do have an application to defend the Gem Life appeal. One of the key arguments is that what we, why we refused it was because it had works that were in the riparian area. I don't want 
uh, this, if, if um, the alternative recommendation gets up, I don't want that thrown in the face of our lawyers as an, in, as an evidence of inconsistent decision making regarding riparian buffers um, uh, used uh, to weaken our chances in that appeal. Um, I think there are broad ranging um, unintended consequences that could come through uh, approving a subdivision that impinges on or has works in a riparian zone. Uh, and again, if the advice was clear, clear cut and unequivocal and the staff concurred, I think we, that could be justified. But where there is an internal conflict between a councillor's opinion, no matter how knowledgeable they are, and our expert staff, I think it's the wise thing to do is to back the staff recommendation. Of course, we want to help applicants at every turn, but this is a marginal application. And uh, Councillor Stockwell's advice, um, although uh, you can understand why it's been proposed, and there are a lot of conditions, there are, you've seen in the advisory note from, from Connor Neville, that um, if, if approved, it would create two different parcels with covenants resulting in additional compliance and monitoring for the ratepayers, increased potential for adverse ecological impacts, because this is one of the key arguments put forward on Monday, um, was that if you can get good environmental outcomes, it's worth considering an alternative. Mm. But having considered the, uh, what's come before us, I'm not convinced that there will be better environmental outcomes given that uh, it increases the potential for adverse ecological impacts re resulting from increase in water abstraction, increase in water harvesting and interception, decreases the recharge of groundwater dependent systems, increase in hard surface areas, increase pressure to clear vegetation due to perceived bushfire risk from the new property being created. It's a septic system that's going in, failure, to, um, failure of wastewater systems leading to eutrophication of waterways and groundwaters. And it's, it's an unreasonable ask not to have a, uh, a new neighbour created by the subdivision to not want a fence down the track. That means it, you can bet your bottom dollar that down the track the council is likely to have to fend off an application to put in a fence line because having a fence to separate properties in, a, in an area such as this if they want to have some sort of animals there, it's entirely reasonable. Um, and as it says here, the perceived benefits do not outweigh the precedent of allowing development in a riparian buffer area. I think we need to think beyond this application, the flow on effects for uh, court cases and our capacity to defend appeals. And also, it is dubious, it is, it is questionable whether it will result in better environmental outcomes. So I, I think it was a great exercise to undertake to see if an alternate recommendation would result in better environmental outcomes? Um, uh, could it protect the riparian area? Um, I, I'm not convinced that it, that it does. So I'll be having my name on this in support of this recommendation. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, just a question. Um, certainly we do have to be careful about precedent. Um, <coughs> what was the nature of development within the riparian corridor in Gem Life? My, my recollection was it was both a major entrance road plus um, construction was in the riparian zone. Is that correct? Um, that's true. The extent of works that were proposed with Gem Life were more extensive, expansive than this proposal. But it is, has similarities in that the riparian buffer for Gem Life had also been partially cleared and they were using the area of the riparian buffer that had been previously cleared. So there are, are some similarities. Yeah. So, <coughs> totally appreciate Councillor um, Wilkie's point of view. Totally appreciate that should rely on expert staff evidence. Um, whether it's a wetland or a waterway makes zero difference. That's a technical ecologist argument about the nature of the landscape in layman's terms, it's a stuffed aquatic ecosystem that's regenerating with some melaleuca and other stuff that could be significantly enhanced by rehabilitation. Absolutely no difference in terms of if I was to suggest what is the most critical areas for rehabilitation, what's most likely to have uh, the best bang for the buck, it is 
about 15 metres either side of the current dams and to the back of the corridor. Kylie, I'd like you to bring up another approval that was done by Delegated Decision Reported. This is a development that was in the Planning and Environment Agenda. Um, this has a mapped waterway which you can follow via the lowest contour through the middle and up the pathway. It's not a riparian corridor, it is a waterway mapped on the biodiversity and waterways wetland. Not only has the, uh, it is a first order stream, it is once again highly degraded. It has the better value stuff protected in a park and it has some of the connectivity um, within the pathway. Sorry, Brian, can you point out exactly what you're referring to there? Uh, <coughs> this is the creek. Okay. Starts up here with wetlands. Okay. But very first order, a few remnant bits of vegetation, but a defined bed and bank of a waterway. Now staff have gone and looked at offsets and, and come up with a solution which they believe meets the performance criteria. I'm happy with that. It is not exactly what I thought would be the, the way I would design it to meet the performance objectives, but staff have come up with a recommendation. But you can see here that in this particular case, because it wasn't a highly significant waterway in terms of ecology, that there's been now, several lots and boundaries put through it. Um, the performance acceptable solution on this case is 10 metres either side of the waterway should be rehabilitated. We might have been talking about that earlier on in the meeting today. So that just, that's already set a precedent about those schemes. It's not in the map riparian corridor, give you that, so that's a high level of protection. But we have to be careful. So it is an argument about what gets the best outcome. If we don't approve the development, the level of water extraction is no different. If we've got two bores or one bore, it's not in a regulated area, they're both likely to be rural residential, they're not likely to be used for intensive horticulture that's going to suck all the groundwater, it's a massive groundwater resource across that basin. So that's, to me, a very minor chance compared to the current level of degradation. Talked about it's going to be a septic system, so there might be eutrophication. Certainly any on-site wastewater has that. But that's why we have the modern Australian standards. And if you look at all the water quality testing that we've done in the rivers and lakes, septics have never been identified. Wastewater have never been identified as the course of nutrient. And in my studies, they rarely are. Generally, it is very, very low-lying areas that haven't got the modern wastewater treatment that you do start to get a signature from wastewater, human wastewater. So I think it's perfectly reasonable position the councillor um, Council Wilkie's put up, that he's concerned about precedent. And he, but in this case, when the extent of development within the riparian corridor is a boundary line and an easement to transverse two dams to get to an area at the back, um, I think it can be conditioned so that we achieve the performance outcome and reduce the potential outcome, or reduce the potential impacts of, uh, of the, not only the development, I think the development can enhance the ecological value if a um, environmental covenant was put over the right areas. So I won't be supporting the motion, but I appreciate the intent behind it. Thank you, Councillor. Um, question. Um, under the Planning Act, a fence line is considered development. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So development is defined by the planning legislation, which includes subdivision, placing or boundary. So it follows then that if, if this is defended in court or it goes to a court, the court will be looking at a very legalistic interpretation of what de a development means in, in terms of the, the fence line. Uh, the court will recognise that this is development through the riparian buffer. Thank you. Can we clarify um, that if um, uh, if an easement, uh, sorry, if a, um, a covenant is placed over uh, and a uh, 
uh, an ecological area is uh, is um, determined for the ent entirety of the uh, the rear of the property. Uh, no fence passes through the centre of that. The existing fence uh, and there are existing fence lines around the property. Do the existing fence lines constitute uh, development? Uh, if it's existing, it's existing. So obviously that's not new development. Um, it's existing. Um, uh, and um, I'm just speaking of the effect. If, if the if the externals of the uh, the boundary of the um, uh, of uh, a potential uh, environmental prote protected area were to be um, uh, fenced, and that came outside of that uh, riparian buffer area, uh, would that all still constitute development within um, the prohibited area? Okay. Um, I think your question is, would fencing around the external boundaries of the whole property now constitute development? No. No? No, I'm suggesting in, uh, so there's, there's, been a, uh, there's been an alternative uh, uh, proposal uh, presented uh, which mentions a, 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 a fence that is basically in front of the, the, the current wetlands area between the, 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 the housing and, uh, and the dam, or the, the, the creek line. Would that, uh, would that fence in that uh, situation uh, uh, be considered as development? If it's if it's a boundary fence outside of the uh, uh, the the, um, the environmental area, as opposed to through the middle of it, as um, uh, a boundary fence would go in the current uh, proposed uh, recommendation or, or proposed uh, development application before us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so development is defined by the Planning Act as a material change of use, building works, or reconfiguring a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that is development. Um, the drafted motion for council um, has included fencing um, to uh, prohibit entry into what is the proposed covenant area and rehabilitation area. Um, that fencing would be outside the area that's been identified by Councillor Bryan as, as being the area that we, we should protect. Um, uh, yeah, that, that area is currently um, Clear of vegetation, I don't have any concern necessarily about that fencing in itself. Question In your experience, are covenants, how are covenants enforced and are, are they very well enforced? Hmm. Um, so, covenants are attached to titles, so they're on title. So, when people buy a property, they can see, see that there's a covenant over title. Um, with that covenant um, goes a, a um, number of requirements about how people are required to treat that area and manage that area. Um, currently we're aware that um, people are not abiding by their covenant conditions, um, but currently there's no officer charged with enforcing those requirements. So we, we're aware just through um, generally looking at aerials around the Shire where people have been intruding into covenants and clearing those covenants. Kerry, it would be fair to say though that, I mean, if, if judging other people on what they're do, doing or not doing uh, is potentially unfair to this applicant who in all good faith says that they're going to adhere to conditions. I mean, just because other people aren't adhering to covenants, it doesn't mean necessarily these people won't. Um, I guess that's for council to decide. Officers are concerned that the covenant won't necessarily ensure the protection of the vegetation that we're, we're trying to protect. So I'm trying to understand what's the purpose of a covenant, covenant if it can't be enforced or there's no compliance um, penalties. Mm. A covenant can be enforced. All I'm saying is at the moment um, we don't have any dedicated resources in council to enforce those covenants. And what are the penalties if they're not enforced and you... Um, do you know? Yeah. One of these 25 years ago, um, <laughs> where you've actually you, you've got the right to enforce it. It's, a, it's a, on the register title, it's, it's binding on successors and titles and so on. So you can actually then seek court orders to bring someone into compliance with what their legal obligations under their, under their um, covenant um, through an application for a declaration in the planning and environment court. I think that would be the, the big stick, so to speak, if you ever got to that point. Obviously, you don't want to get to that point. You want to say to people, here's yeah. your obligations, which you're legally obliged to do. You need to bring that into compliance. If you don't, we might go in and ask. But that's the 
that is the end of it. Could it also be used as a, uh, a point of uh, prevention of uh, sale or uh, um, condition of sale that uh, the covenant has, that has been breached and that uh, sale can't be undertaken until the uh, uh, conditions of the covenant are met? No, that's not something the council could do in terms of its uh, obligations under the, under, sorry, its rights under the covenant. Um, the, a person could do searches and find out if there's you know, litigation occurring or things like that. Um, but ultimately, people buy caveat emperor. People buy uh, when they they buy the property, they buy that the covenant on there and you know, take that obligation on. Um, Kerry, there were lots of concerns about the alternate motion being precedent setting. My understanding on Monday that the conditions were going to be written to avoid um, that possibility. Um, is that the case, or I'm sort of understanding here that there is the potential of this um, being precedent setting? Yeah, one of, one of the things, um, both under the Act and, and would be good practice anyway, is that if council um, are going against um, planning, town planning advice and planning applications, we need to set out the reasons why as part of that decision. What's the reason why you're um, not going to follow that advice? and so one of the reasons we said on Monday in one day a review report to be able to come to this council meeting to look at the um, conditions that might apply um, if council wanted to approve it would include those reasons. So in the, in the report which is attached to the agenda, it does include the reasons which are designed to uh, try and limit the impact of a potential um, argument that the uh, precedent has been set, but the reality is that would still be a, a risk. Um, I'm not prepared to support this motion either. Um, Councillor Wilkie made some really good points. Um, he talked about reputational risk. If you look at it the other way, there is a reputational risk that if we do take this to court and we lose, uh, and the Planning um, Environment Court don't see the decision that the way we thought it, that we will have our name on that document, which is a document which has incurred unnecessary legal fees and costs for our community. It's cost our ratepayer money. That's a reputational risk too. Um, this is one lot into two. This is not gem light. This is, and these are substantially large lots. Uh, we have a precedent where we're already, when we talk about precedent, Councillor Lawrence's alluded to the fact that there will be conditions set out to ensure that doesn't happen. Councillor um, Stockwell has showed us up on the screen uh, decisions that are already being made precedents that are already been there and still we find ourselves here debating this. So we can't necessarily say because we make a decision on this or, or every other decision going forward will be a precedent. The applicants are prepared to work with council, we all know that. They've been really willing and able and they are prepared to adhere to conditions that we set down. You know, often we have applicants who just, it's their way or the highway, it's not in this case. These are very, these are applicants who are very amenable to the conditions we set down. Probably the biggest champion of this environment and protection, protecting ecological land is Council Stockwell. And he has said openly tonight that potentially uh, we can enhance ecological outcomes through the rehabilitation of land undertaken by the applicants. So that, in my mind, adds a lot of weight to, to my reasons and my decision making. So I won't be supporting uh, this motion. Thank you. Question for Kerry, given that uh, Council Stockwell has uh, brought up a uh, another planning application that uh, had uh, similar conditions with regard to uh, uh, waterways and all the rest of it. Uh, is that a similar case to the one we have before us with regard to boundaries and waterways and riparian areas? Hmm. I don't agree it is. And the reason why is the site that's in Croy has no riparian buffer over that waterway. So the Jurama has a riparian buffer that's matched by the biodiversity. The one in Croy that Councillor Brian refers to is not mapped as a riparian area. Uh, subsequent question. <laughs> is it a waterway marked on the biodiversity overlay and does the acceptable solution suggest that it should be rehabilitated 10 metres either side of that waterway? Um, it is marked as a waterway um, and it does suggest 10 metres either side and that, that is essentially what we've been done. You might argue that we should have continued a little bit up further, but um, no, I think we have made a reasonable call. It's only a solution, not an outcome of the scheme as well. 
Just to clarify, I, I believe the outcome meets the performance outcome. Sorry, you have another question, I've just lost it. Councillor Wigman, while Joe's thinking about his question, would you like to speak <laughs> to this motion? I'll speak to the motion. Um, when, this, when the applicant purchased the property, they did not expect to cut it in half. Um, and if we let them do it, others will definitely be looking at their properties and saying, well, we're going to do the same thing. I mean, there's many, many, many of us that would love to cut our properties in half and sell half of it. By letting them, by if, if we follow uh, Councillor Stockwell and we let them cut this property in half, we are arguably changing the planning scheme here by order of councillors, not by the democratic process and through staff. So the question is, what will happen next? Well, this year seems to be the year of unintended consequences. <laughs> we have the glory, we have um, the, the, the glossy situation. Um, in this case, the council and uh, councillors, staff are split. Uh, in my campaign, I promised not to vote against the town plan unless there was an overwhelming public interest to do so. And uh, this doesn't meet that threshold. Question for Kerry. Kerry, is there another subdivision application or reconfigure lot application in the same street that will involve works in a riparian buffer zone? Uh, yes, we have another application which we will bring to council. Um, it's slightly different. Um, instead of the lot boundaries traversing the riparian area, there will be a proposed driveway that they will need to construct through the riparian buffer in order to access the house site. So I would expect we were going to, we're going to have, there will be other properties that are similarly uh, constrained or includes a riparian buffer area in the area that we we will get more applications. Do you expect I'll be watching the outcome of this application with interest? I think they will be watching it with interest and thinking that um, that they may get a positive outcome for their proposal today. Yes. Sorry, I've got a question for Councillor Wagner. Councillor Wagner, you said that uh, let the democratic process go forth and have council staff decide. Would you no. suggest is that? No, I don't mean that the staff, the, the, the planning scheme, when, when we make amendments to the planning scheme and change the planning scheme, you know, we go through the community um, process, the, uh, you know, community consultation process and so forth, just like we're going to be doing with short-term accommodation and so forth. In this case, when we boldly move forward and, um, and allow our uh, application that's clearly against the planning scheme, you're setting a precedent, as we've been talking about, and that's what I mean by because um, I would I would say and correct me if I'm wrong the democratic process is that the seven of us were elected by the community. Oh, point of order, uh, Madam Mayor was debating outside of formal uh, debate. Just so, so thank you. Just democratic process is the town plan. Is that what you're saying? And that we had community consultation on that, and um, the strategic planners and our planning department are, uphold. Are governed or yeah their duty is to uphold that town plan is that what you meant in regard to that statement so I'm, I'm interpreting that it is our job as councillors around the table here to uphold the town plan that that's that is our, that is our, our job we're not supposed to go against the town plan yes okay, thank you okay um, so question there was a statement made about expectation I'm going to expectation I'd like the facts <coughs> So the, my understanding is this site is over four hectares, that under the 2006 planning scheme, a two lot subdivision could have occurred and that the riparian buffer area was smaller. And that in the uh, amendment to the planning scheme in 2020, we actively considered lot size and actively decided to reduce the lot size to be consistent across the Shire and acknowledged that in doing so, we were creating the opportunity for more rural residential lots in Karoiba. Um, yes, there has been a change and a review of all the waterways in our Shire, which was done as a study for the new planning scheme, and that resulted in some changes to the riparian buffer widths. On this side in particular, it did result in an increase the riparian buffer from the old scheme. Um, there were some changes to lot sizes uh, throughout the, the Shire for the rural residential areas and essentially there was a minimum lot size set consistent for all the rural residential areas because it used to vary 
depending on where you are located in the Shire under the 2006 scheme. And I'm just trying to look up or recall um, what that minimum lot size was for this area, because I thought it was actually larger than the 1.5. It was two hectares. It was two hectares, yeah. yeah. But it still would have been able to be subdivided at that. It um, still had insufficient area for two lots in that. Except area. it would have also... Still had the riparian corridor to do Contravened the 2006 scheme because it went through the riparian buffer. And Councilor, sorry, one more question. Because the, the perception that we're going against the planning scheme. So the actual word in the relevant performance outcome is uh, if we don't go to the the acceptable solution in the performance act outcome for waterways and wetlands, it says the biodiversity and ecosystem values of waterways, wetlands and adjacent riparian zones are protected by, and it's A that is the key point, avoiding any new development in riparian buffer areas and wetland areas. So are we suggesting, is, or is it staff's interpretation that avoiding means excluding? Absolutely. Um, I don't know how else to read that, but to uh, read avoid as it shouldn't be in there. Have any other speakers? Can no, I've got another, sure. another question. There was um, uh, some consider uh, some some comment made at some stage through uh, through the debate. I can't remember whether it was last uh, um, uh, during which of the, uh, the the occasions that staff would have considered uh, uh, the um, <coughs> a more suitable outcome if the if the covenant didn't cover just uh, one property boundary, but uh, oh, sorry, it didn't cross two property boundaries, but if the entire environmental area could be placed under one uh, one property ownership, is that able to be achieved in any other way, shape, or form? Here, mm. uh, that was what officers spent a great deal of time on with the applicant to to. Um, review whether they could incorporate their riparian buffer all within one lot rather than put the boundaries through. What that resulted in was some um, proposals where the minimum lot size was not met and the lot size got quite awkward in shape in order to accommodate and provide a suitable house shop site. So they weren't suitable options in the end. So the, in this instance, if um, whilst that, 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 that element can't be achieved, one of the criteria here is that as the uh, lot is, uh, is, is fenced externally, that uh, 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 splitting of the lot would require a fence through the middle of the, uh, uh, of the uh, two properties and through that riparian, uh, riparian area, is that correct? That's right, that's, not, that's now what's proposed is the boundary through the covenant area. So the covenant, there's actually two covenants managed by two separate landowners. So apart from the covenant being owned by two separate uh, uh, landowners, if there was no fence going through the riparian buffer area to divide the two blocks, would that be a suitable outcome uh, by the planning scheme as, uh, uh, um, uh, as it currently stands before us? Okay, so um, we obtained some advice about whether council can condition no fencing, whether a covenant can ensure that no fencing is built on the boundary. The legal advice is a covenant can do so, can include such a requirement. That did not change officers' view around this proposal. Officers okay. are still recommending that the proposed subdivision is not appropriate uh, for the site. We've had um, councillors Wilkie, Stockwell, Stewart and Wegner speak to this motion. Councillor Drusvich, Finzel and Lawrenston, would you like to take an opportunity? Yeah, I've probably got some other questions okay. in relation to where, what the alternative uh, proposal uh, could offer, so as to whether or not to support uh, the, the staff here. So some of the some of the, the, the reasonings uh, uh, against uh, an alternative increase in water abstraction. Can you please un uh, explain what increase in water abstraction means? Mm -hmm. uh, so these are points put together by councillor's ecologist and his um, advice is that the proposal results in potential for adverse ecological impacts um, from increase in water abstraction. So essentially extracting water from the ground, so bores and the like, because, um, because of the water table in the area. So ex ex abstraction means extracting water from the ground. Okay. 
passive usage during the question. Yeah, no, I'll speak on this one. Yeah, somebody else. Um, okay, clearly we are all challenged on this, and I thank you, Council Wilkie, for challenging us. What I'm asking myself is, um, are we going against the plan? Are we eroding process? Or are we actually allowing a little bit of flexibility? We've done this with other development applications. If we find that there is an overwhelming benefit, environmental, social benefit, then, then there is the discussion or consideration that we should look at changing or uh, changing the plan and I hate using the word changing the plan so my question is is there a social benefit is there an environmental benefit um, and is it overwhelmingly enough to not go through due process um, I sit very uncomfortable with this decision Thank you, <sighs> oh my god <laughs> So firstly, thank, I'd like to thank everyone, all the staff, especially the work you've given. You did one application process, gave mm -hmm. us a recommendation, you've gone back, you've given us a second yeah. option. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. And also to all the councillors that have given a lot of time and thought around this and, of course, the applicant who has you know, worked hard as well and um, their representative as well. Um, there is process available to councils if we want to make amendment to any planning schemes. I myself have moved that when I first came into council, so there is a process. If we think that something in the plan is not right, there is a process we can adhere to. On the meeting of 8th of June, uh, where we considered grounds to support the proposal given the wetland area is substantially degraded, and um, the staff went away to give us a report on that, I noted at the time and asked the question because Councillor Stockwell repeatedly said in his opinion. Given it was Councillor Stockwell's opinion and in his own words, um, I think that um, the staff has also given us a recommendation that the issues raised um, around the Council at that meeting was considered, but staff confirms the previous recommendation and they stick to that. Tonight we've looked at what um, could go in the covenant, what's available to us, what is the meaning of development. Councillor Stockwell even called on the new NUSA plan 2020, sec I don't know what section you're calling from, but you said number A, avoiding any new development, which is interpreted by staff that, um, that we are to avoid that at all costs. Fencing was also told by staff to us tonight that is development and we're also doing development on a riparian buffer. Um, I support Councillor um, Wilkie, Frank, Frank <laughs> um, this evening and I will adhere and take on board um, the staff's recommendation um, that they will confirm the previous recommendation. Thank you Councillor Kinsale, uh, Councillor Driscoll. Look, I'm, I don't do this lightly. I, I did visit the property, um, and I did have a look at, you know, I don't know place my own opinion. I also uh, walked the, walk the grounds with uh, someone whose uh, environmental uh, opinion I respect quite greatly, uh, uh, that's Council Stockholm, and saw the potential here for rehabilitation of, uh, of an area, uh, a waterway, a wetland, whatever you want to call it, uh, that's currently badly degraded and I think there is an opportunity here to get an outcome for the community and I think an element of potential to not place any further um, uh, development in the, in the way of fencing through the through the property uh, uh, through uh, uh, as part of this division. I see well, I didn't see that potential and I didn't see that as Council Stockwell uh, is suggesting that there's an alternative that also meets the planning scheme, I wouldn't be voting against this. And in this case, uh, I don't. 
I don't believe uh, refusing the application is the way to go. I believe that there are opportunities here to get outcomes for the applicant and for the community and for the environment. And for that reason, I'm actually going to, for one, a few times in my time on council, vote against the uh, staff recommendation here and, and see if, uh, if that does succeed, see if there is an, uh, an alternative that, uh, that, uh, that may be able to comply with the planning scheme so that we're not going outside the planning scheme uh, to achieve a, 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 an alternative outcome. Question for Kerry. Kerry, just for, the, for our benefit, what are the reasons why councillors can vote against a planning scheme? What is, under what circumstances can they justify a, a, a decision that's, that conflicts with the planning scheme? Um, well, traditionally, um, the planning legislation has required that to be, to, to, that an application must be refused if it's in conflict with the planning scheme, unless there is significant benefit in the community's interest. So that has been the long-term wording in the planning legislation for deciding an application. So refuse the application unless there's significant benefit for the community. And it's in the community's interest, not just for the applicant, it's the wider community. Um, those words are actually gone now from the Planning Act, so they're a little bit different. Um, and the decision rules now are about council must assess the application against the planning scheme, but may consider any other relevant matters. So it's a broader context in deciding the application. Um, and I guess what we're just considering today is we're being careful about our planning scheme um, to ensure we're not creating a precedent, um, because that is certainly what uh, something that is raised by the court regularly in appeals. They look for developments where council has potentially made a decision inconsistent to support their argument in their own case. And that's essentially what officers' concerns are here. I think this opens us up to that, that potential. Yeah. Uh, just the, uh, so obviously the debate is turning on this point about whether you can interpret the Noosa plan uh, to approve this development without going outside it. And so that what I, the question is about, it, it's, we've looked at the performance outcome and you're saying performance outcome in relation to avoiding development, which is a boundary line, doesn't comply with the performance outcome. In that situation, is it then relevant for an applicant to demonstrate that it meets the purpose and overall outcomes of a code? And in this case, the purpose and overall outcomes includes that the development design and layout provides for ecological connectivity across the landscape through protection, rehabilitation and enhancement of native vegetation and ecological linkages. And there's a number of similar things. That's what I'd have to, that's what a alternate motion would have to demonstrate that it met the performance outcomes and therefore would be in keeping with the NUSA plan. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So the statement about no development in the riparian buffer is in the performance outcomes. There are then higher um, outcomes in the code that they need to demonstrate against. And, and that's really what Council's ecologist is saying this proposal does not meet. Any other questions? No. Council will be right at the time. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Look, it's been a really great debate, and I thank Councillor Stockwell for getting us thinking outside the box and having staff bring that alternative report. But there's nothing in that alternative report that yeah. satisfies me that we are going to be meeting either the performance or the acceptable outcomes yeah. under the Noosa planning scheme. As Councillor Finzel rightly said, if we think the planning scheme, the outcomes in the planning scheme, are incorrect or we need, need further refinement. We don't vote, vote against them, we change them through the amendment process. That's the correct process. We know that this case is going to be watched very carefully um, by people in the same street who have similar applications to have works through a riparian zone. Uh, and it would be very hard to argue against their, or very hard for staff to refuse their application for the same reasons if staff are sending a message that, hey, we're going to ignore this staff's recommendations um, and find alternative motions and approve it. Um, the protection of riparian zones are central to the Noosa planning scheme, both performance and acceptable outcomes. Not only avoiding any development, but avoiding edge effects and damage from adjacent land uses. I was open to, to listening to an alternative because 
it was posed that we could still achieve acceptable environmental outcomes or better. But it's clear advice here from um, our staff that um, the, there's increase for that it increases the potential for adverse ecological impacts, and there would be no acceptable outcome that would um, mitigate against damage to the environment out there. Increased potential for eco adverse ecological impacts resulting from an increase in the take of groundwater, uh, which the wetlands are dependent upon. Increase in water harvesting and interception, rainwater tanks filling, so less water going into the ground. In increase in hard surface areas, increased pressure to clear vegetation due to perceived bushfire risk because a new property is going to be out there. Okay. And also the potential for the septic systems to fail and uh, nut uh, nutri eutrophication of the waterways, so like, uh, nitrogen and, and waste escaping into the waterways. And also the, the new owner of the property may want, of the new property, may want to have an animal on there and would need a fence and it's unreasonable for them not to allow them that. Um, it, judgments have been clear in the past. We have been able to... have got such a good... News Council's got a, such a good reputation and success rate in defending planning scheme, so appeals against refusals, because council, meaning councillors, have consistently defended the planning scheme, consistently. When you do something like this, if you put coerce staff to write an alternative report under duress, that point of order. That's a, that's a, a, an assertion on my character, and I think it's an undue one. Uh, there was no assertion or or duress. I will um, argue opposite, and because it was Sorry, a, joint made a, a point of order goes to the um, chair. Councillor, can you yes, raise that statement, please? I'll clarify. When I said duress. It, was, it wasn't Councillor Stockwell that, forced, that had the staff write an alternate report. It was us collectively. I'm equally culpable. So there's no uh, offence intended. And if, if you've took, I, I do apologise if, you, if you've taken offence at Councillor Stockwell because we are collectively responsible for asking staff, putting staff under duress to go against their own opinions and recommendations. Um, and I'm equally responsible for that. But I have read the work that's come back and I'm not satisfied that there'll be a better environmental outcome I'm very concerned that it will create a precedent. I'm very concerned that this decision will be seen, um, will be used against us in the subsequent planning court appeals. And I th really think it represents a turning point and a, a, a crisis point for this council. It's very clear what the staff have recommended. I do respect uh, Brian's opinions, um, but in this case, they're countered. It's not clear cut. If it was clear cut, um, I would, I would, I would go with it, but it's the staff have clearly do not agree, and I think that would weaken our case in an appeal. Uh, and as I said previously, at the risk of repeating, <laughs> repeating myself, repeating myself, repeating myself, <laughs> um, the, the case will be watched very, very carefully by people in that very street with similar, with similar um, applications coming before us. Councillors, please let's hold the line if we disagree with um, the protections for riparian buffer zones, which are critical to Noosa's points of difference uh, in the planning scheme. Let's not go against it now, tonight. Let's change the planning scheme. You, Please support this motion, councillors. I implore motion. you. Thank you. Put the motion to a vote. All in favour? Councillors Finzel, Walkie, Dr um, Wagner and Lawrenceton against. Councillors... Drusevich, Stockwell and Stewart. Motion is carried. Thank you, Thank you Kerry. Thank you, Kerry. Me too. Me too. Right. I think that we have a little bit of chance. Yes. Well, we might. We might. Okay, so moving right along. The... Oh, thank you, Kerry. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, thank you, Kerry. I... So, item two. Uh, page 21. Further report. Thank you, Councillor Stopper. Further report, item 2. Noosa Bushland Reserve Strategic Management Plan. Uh, question for Craig. Craig, I believe there have been some, uh, some minor alterations to the uh, Bushland Reserve Strategic Management Plan that's presented to Council at the last meeting. Can you outline what those, um, those changes have been? Uh, certainly, the changes were explanatory in nature following the discussion we had at the previous meeting, um, looking at providing more information around the value ecosystems provide. 
uh, particularly around the ecosystem services role. Um, we looked at why the ecosystem services are considered a subset of the biodiversity outcomes, which have used to prioritise the bushland strategic management plan. Um, we elaborate a little bit more on the focus of the likelihood of success in the prioritisation of bushland reserves. And we also included some information on how the Coastal Hazards Adaptation Plan and the Coastal Foreshore Management Plan will support priorities in specifically in the coastal strip. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll move. Uh, I'll move the. Thank you, Councillor Rispich. I'll second Thank it. Councillor Wilkie, Councillor Rispich. Look, I think we've uh, uh, long needed a bushland reserve strategic management plan, and I uh, understand that there were some uh, some reservations about uh, elements of throughout the committee and, uh, and and with councillors, and I believe uh, uh, the uh, additions that are being made here uh, for tonight's meeting have uh, have addressed those concerns. Uh, the uh, bushland reserve strategic management plan gives us a process by which to, uh, to approach this in the future, gives us a, 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 an element of understanding of the, the values and the certainty around uh, the, uh, the success around the, uh, um, uh, the, the various bushland reserves and the, the best bang for buck opportunities that will present themselves going forward. So uh, I commend staff for their time and effort. And uh, I'd like to hear from the rest of my councillors in reserve in, uh, in how they accept the uh, plan. Thank you, Councillor Prospect. Would anyone else like to speak to this motion? Why don't we go to questions? Pray. I'll leave it for it to a vote. All in favour? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Craig. Craig. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Yes, you did next, Polly. Thank you. Last Thanks, item. Craig. Thank you, Craig. Last item on the agenda. Welcome, Kerry and Tracy. Uh, item three. Uh, T000039 Mobile Library Contract Award. And we have our Director of Community Services here. Kerry, does anyone have any questions? I'll move a motion. Um, it's a little bit different to what you've got there. Just take out the 12 kilowatt in V, please. Yes, you've read that out. Okay, so uh, the motion is that council note the report by the acting manager libraries and galleries to the ordinary meeting date of 17th of June 2021 regarding the mobile library contract award and award A, award tender T4039 for the construction and supply of diesel option for the new mobile library to GH Barley for Priority Limited. B, install the solar array on a council owned facility to offset the emissions of the vehicle and this be funded from savings in diesel over the life of the vehicle. And C, include in the operational <coughs> budget for the mobile library an internal offset payment equivalent to paying the capital cost of the solar system over a 25 year period. Do we have a second for that? Councillor, yeah. would you be adverse to a couple of words being added into B? Sure. Offset the equivalent emissions of the vehicle's operation. Yeah, of, the, of the vehicle's operations, yes. Um, and would you mind if I add some extra wording on that to offset the, um, the diesel? Equivalent emissions. Um, can we bring forward a <coughs> review of the Go Transport policy um, on page 13? Is this, no, I think no. I, oh, can I have that? That's quite, no. that, that's quite different. That's yeah, not, yeah, you're, we you're, can you're, do that, oh, do that at a later stage. Yeah. Uh, on that end, uh, if the council is uh, accepting uh, of those uh, couple of words to be added there, I'll second the motion. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Firstly, the this has been a very long and um, very well uh, executed process, and so. I don't want to spend a lot of time on B and C, I want to, to spend the time on A. Um, what we have now is a proposal to modernise our mobile library service, to get a smaller, more agile uh, vehicle that can do all what we've been doing traditionally, but also get into smaller sites, can have staff that don't need a heavy vehicle licence, can give us the flexibility to respond to community needs and also provide at this stage, two local communities, the opportunity for a kiosk. <coughs> this is taking our uh, mobile library service into the 21st century. The decision between us today was a two tenders. Uh, the one that we're recommending approval after extensive analysis of the options versus a fully electric vehicle, which probably would be a first of its kind, but would be $150,000 more expensive. You can get 
a heck of a lot of renewable energy for $150,000. And so yesterday we talked about this concept of achieving um, net zero fleet by offsets based on efficiency savings. And I thought today would be a great opportunity to demonstrate how that's happened. Now, Council, I did circulate some figures earlier on, but in our five minute break, I actually got some real figures rather than the ones I initially modeled. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, still the same story, still the same story. The current vehicle annual diesel use is about 5,014 litres based on the 18,200 kilometres of travels. That's about 13 and a half tonnes of CO2 equivalent emissions, okay, at an annual cost of around $6,900. This new vehicle, I've added in 50 extra kilometres a week, so 20,800 kilometres. Annual diesel use will be 3,500 saved, so a saving of nearly 1,500 litres of diesel and emissions reduction by about four tonnes per year but a cost saving of 2,000 tonnes per year. So the proposal yesterday was to do these internal offsets. So it, about one kilowatt of solar offsets about 1.35 tonnes of carbon dioxide, which in this case suggests about seven kilowatts of a solar ray is required to offset this vehicle over its life, which is a cost of about $7,000. So those solar systems can be pretty well guaranteed for about 25 years. So spreading that over the cost, if we did this internal offset to saying part of the operational cost of the library, instead of going to the electric vehicle, is paying around about $283 a year for offsets to pay for a new bit of solar on a council building's roof. So for that $283 a year, that vehicle will be net carbon. And if we wanted to go the cheaper option, just buying offsets, it's about $191 a year, but then we miss out on the benefit of having the renewable energy and cheaper costs to the facility where those solar panels are. So that's what BNC is about. It's about saying we're saving through efficiency a whole lot of diesel. So that'll be some money off the operating budget. We'll put a little bit more on by saying this vehicle will have an internal offset payment to fund more solar on the roof of council building. I'll return back then to the overarching thing is this is a really big day for our community. The current mobile library used by date is last year or the year before. And so this will be a great thing um, when it's on the road and I hope it builds interest and gets a lot more people engaged who might find it difficult to get to our two magnificent libraries in Croy and Nooseville. Thank you, Councillor. So I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not understanding where the savings in diesel are coming from. Oh, the the existing uh, articulated vehicle. The existing vehicle. Oh, uh, gets, semi. The existing semi gets oh. three. It has one litre. Uh, it goes three point six three kilometres. And this vehicle gets 5.85. How's that from memory? 5.88. Oh, 5.88. Close. So the question I had, was there a, a budgeted amount for diesel set aside in the future based on that larger vehicle? Is that where the savings... Um, where is it? The, like have we, is it a real saving? or uh, Have we budgeted... The budget, Money for fuel? So the budget for the 21-22 uh, year was based on the existing vehicle because that was continuing. Oh. But the intention was that when the new vehicle, um, the tender had been awarded and we knew what we were purchasing, that there would be an adjustment um, to the fleet expenditure for that vehicle. Okay, so is there... The money that's been budgeted for and fuel for this the larger vehicle, which we no longer have, um, is that going to be sufficient to cover a solar array? Um, I would have to take that on notice, um, given that this um, has come up late in the piece, um, to look at what the actual saving might be, given that the intention was that over the course of the life that this would be a less cost to the ratepayer, this option, in terms of the life of, uh, in terms of the operation of the vehicle. 
Has the fuel consumption figure the 5.8 litres considered that uh, the vehicle would be laden, or is that the unladen uh, um, uh, fuel uh, consumption of the uh, uh, quoted by the vehicle manufacturer? Um, that was provided uh, to me from the fleet manager this afternoon, um, and I believe it is laden. Thank you. Yeah. So it would be fair to say that, uh, uh, that, that the, uh, uh, the vehicle will save in diesel consumption because of those um, fuel consumption uh, estimates? Yes, it is correct Thank to you. say that there will be a saving. It is a smaller vehicle um, carrying less um, stock and a more efficient vehicle because it is more modern. So it is and correct to say that it will use less fuel. In there will be an expectation. Can I move an amendment? Oh, sorry, Councillor Lawrence. Oh. Just for the benefit of the viewers, um, Kerry, just yep. there were two options, a diesel vehicle option and an electric vehicle option. Can you explain why we didn't go down the electric vehicle option? Um, thanks, Councillor Amelia. Yes, I can explain um, what was um, provided in the report. Uh, so... Um, the evaluation panel were very supportive of looking for options for um, reducing emissions and through the evaluation there are a number of different criteria that the electric option did not meet. Um, so the diesel option was selected because um, predominantly the size, it has 20% larger size, it holds 500 more items. It has an internal cabin walkthrough, which goes from the vehicle into the back, which creates more space and the feeling of space and weatherproofing. Um, the contractor has um, significant experience in building specialised builds, build, builds like mobile libraries on diesel powered vehicles. Um, and uh, we have strong confidence with addressing service or repair issues highly reputable, reputable contractor. There were some concerns too, wasn't, wasn't there, Tracy, that you know, with the electric vehicle being of this size and this magnitude, and we um, could potentially, and I believe it came from Melbourne, is that correct? The, the manufacturers were down south, and that if there was any concerns or breakdowns, that it would actually have to be transported back there and, and be sort of um, fixed down there. Yes, C Electrics is a subcontractor, and there is the potential that um, there's challenges with servicing and repair because they're based in Victoria. And, they, they and, and I guess being based in Victoria and every time you've got to repair and to go back and forward, that's time off the road and that's time away from our ratepayer and, and people having using and enjoying that amenity of our libraries, uh, library service. Yes, you're absolutely correct. So it would entail a contractor or a technician coming up to us to repair the vehicle or time off the road for the vehicle to go down for repairs. And Council Stockwell said there was $150,000, it was more expensive for the electric, but it was also the whole, uh, there was a higher whole of life cost associated with the electric vehicle too, wasn't there? Yes, you're correct. So the whole of life costing for the diesel option is $527,000 and the electric option was $620,000. Thank you. Could I um, oh, amendment. propose an amendment? Mm. So, as it as it reads, but for in in B, I would like it to read um, provide a further report to council. On the feasibility of installing. A solar array on a council-owned facility to off um, to offset the feasibility of installing a solar array on council facility to offset the equivalent of emissions of the vehicle operations to be funded from savings in diesel diesel over the life of the vehicle, <coughs> and the further point and to include. Sorry, should we, uh, the report uh, to, inc 
which includes the feasibility. No, sorry, just leave it at that. Just leave it at that. Okay. Can I have a second of that motion? Councillor Lauriston, yeah. Thank you. Look, um, what I'm trying to do here, councillors, is rather than have the staff just go and there's a, there's a body of work that needs to be done before this can be achieved. I'd like to know if, it can, if it's feasible, what the costs are, what the savings are, and give staff a chance to do a bit of research that we're included in that, kept in the loop about how that's going. Um, I don't know if... This is, this, is, this is intended to have us kept in the loop on how that project is going and if it's feasible or not and what the costs are. Thank you. Can I have a clarification, no. Councillor? Uh, is it your intention to maintain item C or to delete it? <coughs> I would just like to... Uh, at this stage, I'm happy for it to stay, but I'd just like to work through the repercussions of, of B first and then address C. Could C be included, Councillor Wookie, as part of B in that report? Mm. And Councillor Wookie indicated that he was going to test B first, mm. item, and then depending on what happens to that, mm. whether he tests B. Yeah. But in answer to your question, mm. potentially yes. Mm. But, um. mm. Councillor Wigner. Um, I have a question about the, the savings. So we're, the savings we're interpreting from having a bigger car to now a smaller car, and so we're saving, we're, we're taking, but is that really true savings? I mean, if, if I have a bigger car and I sell that and I buy a smaller car, I'm not really saving, I'm just, that's just what the smaller car uses. I wouldn't consider that a savings necessarily. You don't save until you make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The short answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I'll make it easy for councillors. I actually think there's no problem with the amendment as is. I think it's important. I'll be trying to move this sort of motion every time we buy a new bit of fleet. I think it's important that we do make a commitment. You know, we have been marrying up between an electric vehicle and, and and a new iconic bus. And I think it's important that we say to the community that this bus service is going to be carbon neutral. I think. We make the commitment. I'm happy for the feasibility about whether it's council owned facility or an offset. I think that's that's okay. I can, um, if it, I think in terms of it, the logic to the budget is that we're, if we're reducing the operational budget, in this case on today's value, the difference between the, the last vehicle, or the current vehicle at 18,200 kilometres and uh, the new vehicle at 20,800 kilometres, the difference is, um, $2,023 a year in fuel. So when we're looking at trying to transition our fleet to zero net emissions, that is a real savings. It's a savings from emissions. And what I'm saying is when we look at the operational budget, that we bank most of those savings, but about two to $300 of it goes in offsets to make it carbon neutral. It's simple. Um, so I'm happy with the amendment in terms of the feasibility. We can look at the options, what's the most cost effective, but um, I would resist any change to C. Oh, I've got a question and it might be, uh, might be directed at our um, Director of Corporate Services. Michael, um, Council Stockwell said that this should be done on every vehicle. It's important that we look at this. Can you tell us over the next 12 months how many vehicles we will be replacing? Tell you how much the dollar amount is. One point seven million bucks off the top of my head. Um, look, uh, to, to the mayor, um, we're looking at roughly twenty of oh, vehicles and plant at twenty five to twenty six. So, would that then, if we had to be consistent, would that mean that every time we replaced? A vehicle or plant, and then we're looking at 25, 26 in the 12, next 12 months, we'd actually have to look at putting solar on 25 of our buildings? No. No, it's not. Uh, I can answer that. Under this uh, proposal, it, this relates to the lighter vehicle. 
No others. But so it, sorry, the item, yeah, yeah. So the item before the council is about the library vehicle, not not about a general plan. But but Councillor Stockwell said we have this is important to do every time you know every time we look at a new vehicle that we should take this into consideration. So that was what I was getting to. Yeah. Can I have a crack at my Can I have a crack at my answer that for you? <laughs> the, the, the situation here is we're we're changing vehicles. We're changing from mm. a, a higher consumption vehicle to a lower consumption vehicle. What we're doing in in our fleet, I would imagine, in most instances, is a like for like type replacement i.e. a four-wheel drive for a four-wheel drive as it's come to the end of its life. So that may not be a comparable situation with each of the fleet vehicles. So, question, have we got a desire to increase the fuel efficiency on all our new equipment? So yeah. we recently we've transitioned to hybrid small vehicles for fleet. Yeah. Councillor, I'll just remind you that what's before council tonight is the mobile library yeah. thing, not, not our fleet yeah. and, and yeah. transport strategy, whatever it might be. It's just a question about whether or not yeah. we're accepting a tender that relates to our mobile library. Yeah. Yes. Can I just add a comment? Can I just make I a comment on that too? I understand we're changing the vehicles. I think in support of that, we're community expectation going towards, you know, zero emissions, our commitment to um, climate change and things around that and our fleet. I think we're trying to offset the emissions from now having a diesel vehicle. So I'd like, I support it in a way that I think we should review in the next 12 months fleet options to electric vehicles to offset the fact that now we are getting a diesel vehicle as opposed to an electric vehicle and trying to explore how we're going to offset that Councillor Stockwell's talking about it in terms of the operation of the bus. I'm talking at a more strategic level to offset the vehicle emissions as well around the, the bus that's diesel. And for the life of that, how can we also contribute to reaching strategic targets around taking action on the climate change and um, in support of our zero offsets and our emissions? Is there a way we can add into this um, amendment to the fact that we will bring forward a review in the next 12 months fleet options to electric vehicles which I believe it's currently being looked at through the go transport strategy um, through some customs. Is this a point of order? Is this relevant? To question just, question or order. Well I'm just it's seeing how I can add to that amendment. You can't, you can't amend an amendment. So, oh. yeah, so that it's we, we debate. But, but you've still got time. Are you, have you finished speaking to this amendment? The solar one. The, the amendment by Councillor Wilkie, seconded by Councillor Lawrenston. Yeah, I have more to say about that. Okay. Um, we've uh, had Councillor... Look, I'll, I'll speak to it. Um, look, I, uh, I, I concur. There's a, I, I think it's uh, it's prudent to provide a further report to Council so that we do see if there is a feasibility installing a solar array or I would argue some other type of uh, offset where maybe might be an opportunity for a wind farm. But, uh, but we should look at um, all, all, uh, all options for uh, the potential for an offset of the equivalent emissions of the vehicle, given that we're, uh, we're going down the track of a diesel vehicle in this case, as opposed to electric vehicle, which was uh, the other option here. So I support the amendment. Uh, it would be good to know, uh, whilst uh, Councillor Stockwell has done some preliminary uh, investigation and some uh, prior some figures, it would be good to have a, uh, uh, an understanding of what the actual equivalent emissions of the vehicle will be and what level of um, offset that may attain more accurately. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Council um, I think that this is actually an exciting day, as, as Stockwell says. I'm, I'm really <coughs> excited about what uh, Council Stockwell proposes. And what I, what I, in my, the way I understand it, is we are incorporating, um, internalizing externalities. That is, we're, we have the externality of the emissions from the, 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 the truck, and we're internalizing these emissions through um, through sol solar panels to get a, n a net neutral um, project, which is our, our library. And uh, so I, I think it is a big day, and I'm really happy that we're talking about internalizing the externalities in this particular project. It would be great to move it through other aspects of, our, of all the different things we do. Um, I'd like to support this amendment and commend Councillor Stockwell for, um, well, he's got a habit at the moment of just reminding us of our 
obligations to the environment. Um, so thank you. Keep doing it. Yeah, look, I think um, I'd like to thank Tracy. You, this has been a long road, um, and thank you very much for all your hard work. And Kerry, you too. I mean, this was clearly. I mean, the community wanted an electric vehicle. We all wanted an electric vehicle, but clearly, the diesel just. I mean, this was a lay down was there. Question is, are you addressing the amendment or the substantive motion? Yeah, that was a kind of good Actually, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <It's a long laughs> thank you, Councillor Stockwell. Um, I will support this motion. Uh, but I do think, I, I thank Councillor Wilkie because I wouldn't have supported the original uh, motion put forward by Councillor Stockwell. I support it because uh, we, we wax lyrical about just on the last um, item on the agenda about a proper process. And if we want to amend something, we have to go through a proper process. So this is a further report to council on the feasibility is the proper process. It gives the staff an opportunity to investigate and to see whether or not this is actually feasible, to see what the cost is. And I keep coming back to the cost to our rate payer, but this is an opportunity for us to find all those things out. So I'm happy to support this amendment. Uh, all in favour? Um, I'll beg your pardon, yeah. I'll reply. Sorry, Councillor. Yeah, yes. Oh, um, <laughs> thank you. Look, um, uh, this is about due diligence. I know yeah. Brian's done a lot of work, he's done all the costs. We're not aware of them, staff aren't aware of them. Um, we need to all be kept in the loop about this. I'm just going to flag that um, uh, if this, this amendment is, is carried, becomes part of the substantive motion, I'm going to propose another uh, amendment that. B be amended to also include and uh, feasibility of including in the operational budget for the mobile library and internal offset payment equivalent to the paying for the capital cost. So we know we're all on the same page about what we're signing up for, what we're signing ratepayers up for. So um, I'll commend the amendment to you. Thank you. All in favour? Unanimous. Thank you. I'll move another amendment. Thank you, Councillor Wilkie. I'll second that. <laughs> 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 oh, let me get it out. Uh, I'll squeeze it out. <laughs> so, it, uh, item B of the amendment. Uh, yeah. So, B to read as as is. Yeah. And. Include. And yep. Yeah. I'll and in, and. Uh, and the feasibility of including in the operational bu budget, of including in the operational budget for the mobile library an internal offset payment equivalent to paying for the capital cost of the solar system over a 25 year period. I'll second that. Thank you, Thank you. Councillor Stewart. Look, it's, it's consistent with what has been proposed in the original motion, but it just brings more information to us so we can all be fully informed about the costs and potential savings and give staff time to do a body of work that they can share with us before we adopt it on behalf of the council, the community and the right players. Thank you. Um, as for Shadow, I can't support this unless there's another amendment that comes forward and it stipulates that it is our intention to make this vehicle carbon neutral. Very simple. I'll, I'll vote against the substantive motion if we don't make that uh, that case. Thank you, Council. Will we deal with this amendment um, first? Um, would anyone else like to speak to this amendment? I'll close if no one else no. is going to speak. Please do. Yeah. Look, there's nothing, there's nothing in this um, amendment that suggests that none of us are against the, the idea of creating a carbon neutral vehicle. Um, we just like to know how it can be achieved, and uh, we'll all be on the same page when we undertake that journey. Mm, thank you. Can I speak? Yeah. Oh, let's do try to reply. That's try to reply. Did you get an opportunity to uh, speak? All, all, uh, we'll, put, we'll put the amendment to a vote. All in favour? Uh, that's Councillor Drusevich, Councillor Finzel, Councillor Wilkie, Councillor Wegner, Councillor Lawrence, and Councillor Stewart against Councillor Stockwell. Uh, motion carried. Thank you. Oh, no, that, I was going against. I've got a feeling there's yes, another amendment coming in. Councillor, just to remind that the, the candid motion is about the um, tender for the library. Yep. I'll, yeah. I'll speak to the um, original motion if I, yes. if I can. Yes, Brian, to anyone else then? Look, it's, it's, um, 
it's quite easy to think that this this um, motion before us is all about Councillor Stockwell's um, <laughs> additions, but it's it's all about the community getting a new mobile library. Uh, the mobile library is has been well loved from more than a decade. It's um, part of the landscape in the hinterland and remote areas. People eagerly await its arrival. It has brought, uh, it has enriched the lives of so many, and the transformation to a smaller, more mobile library has been eagerly awaited. And there was extensive consultation about what the new library will look like. Mobile library will look like. It's been an enormous amount of work by staff, especially Tracy King, um, a manager of libraries and galleries, who for many years has trucked the big semi all over the Shire, uh, has a trucker's licence. Uh, thumbs up to you, Tracy. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I also support any, uh, the, the notion that we need to be, we measure the, the, um, the emissions, the impacts on the environment that our purchases do have. Um, so that's why I'm supporting the, that's why I moved those uh, amendments and uh, that Councillor Stockwell brought forward. But it's about the community getting a new mobile library. It's eagerly anticipated. Thank you for all the work you've done and I look forward to seeing the new vehicle. Thank you, Councillor Wilkie. Anyone else like to speak? Councillor Jeff's speech. Look, I commend staff uh, for their time and, uh, and diligence on this. Uh, I know that uh, it was uh, our intent to see Council's first full electric vehicle come to the fore here. Uh, and I know that staff pursued uh, many avenues down that path. But uh, it seems once again we're just at the forefront of uh, technology and the uh, we're not, uh, probably not quite there as far as uh, solar vehicles in the <coughs> commercial range uh, goes for this, uh, this type of activity. It will fulfil all of the, uh, uh, the um, criteria that staff had. This vehicle will pr provide additional safety for staff and for the community because we won't be driving that articulated vehicle that's uh, near the end of its life around the, uh, uh, around the community. It'll modernise uh, further library options, uh, provide emission uh, and, and here with uh, the uh, proposed uh, change, we'll provide uh, an opportunity for reducing emission uh, options over the life of, uh, of this vehicle, uh, which I find is a great outcome, or at least the next best outcome we could possibly have, given that we've uh, gone with the diesel option. Uh, I commend Council Stockwell on his uh, desire to see uh, the offsets uh, achieved, and I do think we're delivering now. If he needs another amendment to further uh, guarantee that we will uh, look at the offsets over the life of the vehicle, I'd be happy to support that. Uh, but uh, as, uh, the CEO, like as, as the CEO... <laughs> as the CEO reminded... I have to think about how I would. As the CEO reminded us, this is about the library vehicle and the library service that it's going to deliver to the community for uh, for the future. Uh, it'll be a far more, uh, far more nimble vehicle, a far more uh, serviceable vehicle. It'll be a, a, a far more drivable vehicle. So it'll uh, give a greater opportunity for more staff to be able to uh, do it and not need a special licence to under uh, undertake the operations, which, uh, which pre presents a challenge in itself and requires uh, uh, further, further um, uh, skills and, uh, and skill sets and driving uh, what is a challenging vehicle, a very large, heavy, articulated vehicle around bends and hills going to King Kin and the like. So, uh, so the... the, the uh, the option here has provided, you know, will provide a, a greater, I said, greater variety of uh, uh, of options with uh, locations as well, and so I commend staff for bringing this uh, uh, proposal to us to uh, upgrade the facility for the community for the future. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Can I say now? Can I say? Yeah. Oh. And when do I raise the amendment then? Now. Yes. When did you move amendments? Oh, can I? Yeah. Can I move an amendment now in support of uh, Councillor Stockwell's desire to go to carbon neutral vehicle? I uh, request a further report back to Council to measure the impacts of the diesel bus. Um, and can we offset that by bringing forward in the next 12 months a review of the fleet options to go to electric vehicles? Yeah. Sorry, could, um, so, what amendment could deal with the library bus issue, but it's not about the report before council tonight, it's no. not about the uh, council's fleet, it's only about the library bus. So I understand. Can only yeah. Deal with that. yeah, I understand that, but can't we look at other options to bring the vehicle to a zero carbon offset? 
for the library, library vehicle? Yeah. Yeah. But if and we were to bring other vehicles, electric vehicles on in the bigger scheme of things, do, would that offset the diesel in the bus? Uh, no, so as I said, just come back to that point you know, before that the, the issue before council tonight is the library um, bus tender. So any decision that relates to anything outside that um, would be beyond what's been considered tonight. Okay. So it's got to be related to that okay. library bus. All right, thank so you. Are you during the amendment? Okay. You don't want to make an amendment? Oh, well, I'll withdraw the amendment and speak to the motion. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> um, right, okay, so. Thank you, this everyone, for your work. I really appreciate that. I campaigned on this issue, um, and it's just uh, wonderful that together we can strengthen communities, and we've worked together, and the staff worked really hard to deliver a walk-in vehicle, which was, you know, um, really brought concern to community because socially it was a place where people meet, people can um, talk to other people, be engaged in community. It's great that this additional um, library now provides kiosks smaller vehicles can get to other festivals and other things and i think it's a win-win for community in terms of the service we've provided thank, thank you, you. i'll make this quick um, i commend staff and support staff for taking a pragmatic approach to this recommendation i know that you guys were as disappointed as we do um, for not taking up the electric vehicle option um, but as Joe, um, Councillor Jurisovic pointed out, right now it's just not viable and the risk is too high for Council to pursue given that the electric option, in, in um, particularly for a vehicle this size, in, is in its um, early stages of development. Um, I know there's been a lot of heart and hard work put into this project. Um, this is an important service to the community and it's an important asset. And I just wanna make note that we think that you guys are an important asset to um, this community as well. Thank you, Thanks. Tracy. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you. Just quickly, um, this is very exciting. Uh, thank you for your work, obviously. It's been fantastic taking us on the journey. And before we had the big truck, and above, with my kids, I once called it a possum because it's Pete, you know, Pete carries carries little ones. And um, I've, now this new, the new truck, uh, perhaps we could name it the Honey Glider because it's smaller, quicker, fits in a small oh, area. <laughs> Thank you for your work. Yeah. Thank you. Look, I'll be very quick too. Smart. Thank you very much, Tracy. This has been a long it's process. Smart. We've had a lot of um, workshops with it. Thank you, Kerry. Um, this is a huge amount of work. We've all been disappointed about the electric, none more so than you, but really if, when we looked at the tender, it was just to lay down the Z for support of the yeah. diesel. Um, we'll certainly work towards with the amendments that have been made, um, offsetting that and looking at how we can really help um, in other areas to, to mitigate that, that, um, that diesel. But thank you again. Thanks. Uh, put the motion to a vote. Oh, I'll be fine. Fine. <laughs> reply. Sorry, Brian. Um, so Councillor Willicke is quite right. This isn't about my additions to the staff recommendation. This is about a major thing for our community. Mm. Um, and reflecting over the last few minutes, it was my tactics that were wrong. Um, I should have moved the additions as an amendment and brought that out and so I could come back to this. So I won't vote against this. I think it's far too important to support the library service. Mm. But I will say on a point of principle, I think it's very poor that this council doesn't show the leadership to step away from business as usual. I do think we have to make every decision a step in the right direction. Mm. And I think with such a high profile vehicle, this was an opportunity for councillors to not just ask for the feasibility, because there's nothing in B says we'll do anything. It says we're going to look into a feasibility report. If you're a bureaucrat, that means, ha! Ah, that means we can put it off for a year and not make a decision. It's a very bureaucratic amendment that came to this point of town. I understand that it's good to get staff to report rather than the council rushing off before six, and I totally accept that. However, I do think it's important that mm. we were making a decision between a costly low emissions <coughs> vehicle and a diesel vehicle. And all we've done so far tonight is say, we'll take the cheaper option. The more practical option, the more utility option, and the one that has a long, short, shorter life. We haven't said, but we're going to also take the step to be responsible with the emissions coming from that vehicle. I have ultimate support in my fellow councils and the staff that we will find a solution, but 
but I'm just noting that I think tonight was an opportunity to say to this community that we're not operating business as usual. And a feasibility report says we might not be. But I will support it. I'll retract my previous empiric stand I was going to have and say thank you, staff. It was an excellent process over the you know, two terms of, gov uh, of council. Uh, lots of good feedback to the community to get to a point where in a few months' time, we'll have a, a service going at the community we can all be proud of. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. We'll put the motion to a vote. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. There are no confidential items. We have no submissions to public question time. Thank you, everyone, that brings us to the end of our agenda. The next meeting. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you, Tracy. The next meeting.